if you saw the North Korea um, embassy got attacked. In oh, in Madrid. Madrid? Yeah. <laughs> and a Marine, a U.S. Marine, ex-Marine got arrested. Yeah. Well, they were saying before that dude got arrested, they were accusing FBI. FBI. In, or like CIA, CIA involvement. Yeah. Because um, the one person that they had um, found involved initially was like a Mexican citizen named Hong who lived in the United States. Man, so I, I wish the, the <laughs> microphone could pick up my face I just made. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> yeah, it was definitely uh, weird, weird moment to read that line of facts where it's like Mexican citizen named Hong living in the United States. <laughs> and they attacked him. North Korea, North Korean embassy. Yeah. So, I guess it was four people. Um, was the initial? There must have been some weird clandestine operation that had been in effect, or like way in advance, that just kind of played out now. Yeah. I don't see any. That, that's that's so weird. Why why Madrid? There's got to be some reason. Yeah. Um, but. I well, mean, well, Madrid's been kind of a like a, a well, they a, they've had a hotbed of yeah uprising of activity the, and like, since 2011 and like fascist so. activities and neo-fascist groups and um, yeah nationalist groups. Well, and I bet it would be easy to manipulate media since it's mostly probably not English speaking. I mean, it's not like people don't speak English, but their media is going to be coming out in Spanish first. Mm -hmm. So then it's like. Any story is going to be able to be manipulated, and, and Spain's also had like a long history of like you know messed up government activity, anyways. Mm -hmm. So I think that that you have a if you have a population that already distrusts their government, it makes it easier. Yeah. Wow, Europe! What a strange place to try and gain a foothold of any kind. Well, it's just like the Ukrainian people just elected a, a Russian comedian. back dude. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> they elected a rookie politician comedian as the president, and I and the crazy part about it is I guess he made a movie. Is he like Trevor Noah or something? I, I mean, it would be the equivalent. That's funny. And if and if Trevor Noah had just made a movie about accidentally becoming president before he became president, Whoa. yeah, he he made a movie about accidentally becoming Whoa. a comedian, accidentally becoming president. Holy crap! He he inceptioned this universe into. Electing him president. I'm not sure. That's some super. If it's hard, real yet. That's some I mean, super hardcore. It was in BBC. Yeah, no, for sure. Like, it was in it was in BBC and not the Onion. So this just happened today. Holy crap. Um. <laughs> so that's why I'm like. <laughs> it it may still come out that this was all a joke. Okay, this guy is clearly like a yellow ring bearer, like. <laughs> 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 like straight up this guy's got a yellow fucking ring of power he's got a yellow lantern somewhere this is <laughs> no fucking way yeah <laughs> well apparently uh, uh, Putin rode into a brand new bridge into Crimea like it, on a parade like when did that happen? like last week I think oh damn <laughs> yeah so anything's possible anymore yeah anything everything's possible <laughs> when you have Putin talking about the United States as the world's biggest terrorist, like when when Jimmy Carter tells Trump <laughs> not to worry about China because they've spent the last thirty years not investing in war but investing in infrastructure, <laughs> and that they have eighteen thousand miles of, of high speed trains and yeah. we have like forty, <laughs> <laughs> because we've engaged uh, in endless wars. Yeah. When, when when Jimmy Carter is defending China. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man. Oh, shit. Well, they're also talking about invading Iran now. Again? Again, where you're like, come on, guys. Like, Man, they're, they're just trying to get clean electricity. Just let them have clean fucking electricity. Saudi Arabia is already killing people in Yemen, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, poor bastards. Yeah. 
Well, it's just one of those things where anytime people talk about attacking Iran, it's clear that they have no understanding of history whatsoever. And then it's like, um, people, I, Americans who've never left the country think that these operations are just sending a, a few planes in and bombing them. Iran and, surrededed by like mountains and exactly. all the one side of the yep. one side they're not surrounded. It's like bordered it's by It's effectively Iraq. a it's naturally like, fortified yeah. city. Or, and it's, I mean country in, and the, in the sense And it's resource rich. Um, like extremely resource yeah. rich. Yep. So, so and it's, it's like it's like it's like if Korea had the ability to produce its own enough food for itself. I mean Korea is sitting on Six trillion dollars worth of minerals, resources, but they can't grow any food on those minerals. I mean, and now, it's, now there's now it's, there's trade is going to happen. But. Well, it's, it's it's one of those things where you would say you can't grow food in downtown Beijing, but that's if you don't use vertical farming. Well, that's true. And of course, then the Chinese <laughs> are like, "Oh yeah, hold my rice bowl," <laughs> yeah. and then they grow. They build some giant like vertical greenhouse that's the size of a freaking New York skyscraper. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and then they're like, "Oh, you can't grow really? shit in the middle of the city." Okay, we'll show you. Oh, by the way, we installed a a, a miniature ski slope on top of it. <laughs> it's it's a it's a triple blue diamond or whatever. <laughs> The snow is is sustainable, by the way. It's it's pretty. It's it's we create it by extracting uh, moisture from the air from the greenhouses. <laughs> Man. Sometimes I wish I lived in China. Like, there's so much cool shit going on there. Yeah. There's a lot of cool stuff going on in America too. It's just not quite as. It seems like people in, in other countries are more willing to throw money at stuff. Mm -hmm. Like when I look at pictures of Singapore, that place looks like the future. Like it looks like. It looks like a version of the future that Blade Runner never could have approached because Blade Runner is still, you know, you know, completely tied to desperate levels of of, of economic ability, mm -hmm. and it's just. I mean, Blade Runner is dystopian. It's completely dystopian, and, and in a lot of ways, well, in a lot of ways, Singapore is very similar in terms of economic despair, disparity. Mm -hmm. But like, it's also not a dystopian future. It's it's clean and you know well they've got really interesting architecture even though there's still disparity they've raised the lowest standard of living enough to where it's pretty high it's, it's like it's, it's bearable to be in the yeah. lowest it's my understanding is like it, even like the the low end in in singapore is still pretty nice for the rest of yeah. asia yeah. like you're doing it's like high on the hog and compared to some parts of like malaysia or anywhere else and you can go further into that peninsula mm -hmm. well and I think it also depends on a lot of times the native population will have a different set of standards than the immigrants yeah so it's like well I feel like Singapore is what happens to China if they're allowed to have real free free economic uh well free free economy instead of state sanctioned capitalism well, and that's it's that's one of those strange things where it's like state sanctioned capitalism has technically proven to be more profitable yeah. than any other form of yeah. econ economics that we've seen right now. Whether it's Saudi Aramco or but, China Inc. But Singapore is this really weird, like <laughs> isolated Incident almost where. Well, how, what's the population though? See, oh, I don't know. It's, it's like not that big. Forty million. Yeah, it's not some, that big. Some not very big. It's, where it's it, not it also even... makes a huge. That's a huge factor, yeah. and if you have um, a lot of money and a not huge population, and and the, and um, the land mass isn't really that big. Yeah, it's, it's not like big. it's Indonesia or some yeah. shit. Fucking. Where it's all spread out, and you have to spend <laughs> more money getting to the rest of it than you do like once you're on it. Yeah. <laughs> And then you have to compete with like nine hundred other million people, nine hundred million other people, <laughs> and and and, uh, and fucking tsunamis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But now I think I think Southeast Asia is a really interesting place because it seems like there there's some parts that that hold on to the these older cultures, old, cultural traditions, really, really well, and then 
there are places like Singapore and Macau and Hong Kong that are just super modern. I mean, just the, absolutely the future already. Mm-hmm. I think Macau is actually more like Blade Runner than any other place on Earth, from what I've seen. Because it's just, you know, tall buildings everywhere, and they're lit up all the time, and mm-hmm. gambling, 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 more gambling. Like, um, we we have uh, Atlantic City and Las Vegas, and, you know, some pretty crazy shit goes on there. But then there are also places, like, in Europe, like, um, what is it, like, uh, Monte Cristo or something like that, mm-hmm. and that's where like really wealthy people would play. And then, then in my mind, it's like, yeah, but people who want to like, you know, bet entire islands, they go to Macau, Monaco, Monaco. Yeah, it's like a what is it like a one, <laughs> one mile? <laughs> it's like a country. Strip, yeah, but it's got the fucking GDP of like <laughs> Italy or something. <laughs> 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 That's, that's insane. That's like oh, there, there are other places like that, like uh, Luxembourg or Liechtenstein, in like in uh, some, I guess right on the cusp of, East, of you know the middle of Western Europe. They're like um, it's basically the big size of big cities, uh, in in between like uh, in Germany France and France, France yeah. and, and I think that like one of them, their their primary export is like watches, mm-hmm. and the other is like cheese or something probably. Mm-hmm. But it's like it's like one of those things that it's they create such a, a high level of these products that that's all they need to produce. Mm-hmm. And and of course they've got they had so much money in the early days. They're like, no, we're not going to pay your taxes. We're going to be like we'll form our own trade bureaus. Sorry, no, we're organized. Yeah, and, and they were just able to main, maintain some kind of autonomy. Well, they kept getting um, annexed back and forth. Yeah, for like hundreds of years. The whole region, there's like Alsace Lorraine, yeah, and Luxembourg, and all those. Like the, they they maintained cultural autonomy, but they were absorbed into various uh, various empires yeah. at different points. Like, and that's that's where that's why they were able to maintain their uh, culture because they were I, they had essences of both sides, but enough to separate themselves from one side or the other at the, at any given point. Yeah. I like to think about the uh the French city where they where the the, the Turks show up and they didn't have anything but they had bread. The guy made croissants and the Turks were like, We'll eat your bread and spare your city <laughs> <laughs> French have some good bread. Yeah. Those buttery twisted Delicious breakfast confection things, mm-hmm. man. They're so fatty. I used to work at a cafeteria called Encore Cafe, and we would we would serve uh, croissants. And I remember that, like, by the end of the day, like the batch that we had would be all stale. But if you took a pat of butter and set it on top of it, and then threw it in this toaster oven thing they had for like a minute, it would come out just perfect, like flaky and rejuvenated and mighty croissant again. And um, I think I gained a lot of weight that summer, actually. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's interesting. Well, when it comes to cooking, like, I've been trying to analyze the process as I, you know, as I've lived, where you, where you look at, like, a microwave and how it's heating the water and objects internally versus cooking from the outside in. Yeah. And it, it's such an interesting, like, then it makes sense as to why you can't heat up bread in a microwave very well because it's like... There's no moisture to right. excite. Yeah. And, or it pulls the moisture out instead of baking it back in. Yeah. So it's just weird. Once you look at the different ways to cook things, it's like, oh, of course that's why if you put a pancake in the microwave... It just, it just, yeah, it comes out like dry and somehow soggy at the same time. <laughs> or, or if you put a French fry in the microwave. Oh, God. That's like the worst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Like anything fried really just doesn't work. Yeah. If if it's been fried, I feel like you just gotta bake it or refry mm -hmm. it. But refrying is dangerous because refrying, yeah. There are only really a few things that you can do twice fried, like twice fried pork, chicken um, wings. Yeah. Twice um, fried at tw well, Peking, anything is twice fried. Mm. Um Basically, a bunch of Chinese dishes you can t fry twice. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else is is questionable. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's how Hooters wings get that finish. They, they oh yeah, fry that's them right. Twice. Which my grandma loved Hooters wings. So she was, that's a, that's she would the, always send me to Hooters. <laughs> that was the funniest shit. And then she got sick of chicken for a while because she would, and yeah. give me some chicken. He's like, what? He's like, you heard me. <laughs> yeah, that's the craziest shit. What I say? <laughs> <laughs> but it was specifically Hooters wings. Oh, that's she awesome. She fucking loved them. Oh, that's great. <laughs> okay. Man, I don't know if you've seen... There's a lot more meatless options. Like they're trying out turkey, and uh, I mean the chicken's been there, but it's different types of chicken now. Where they're like doing grilled versus fried, and oh, cool. Um, are they like, are they infusing like some kind of fat oil or some kind to, no, to produce different? I mean they're keeping like, it vegan. Okay. Or not necessarily vegan, but like vegetable. Based in in a lot of these cases, because the the um, lab grown proteins that are actually based from meats are like those are still in they're they're still at a phase where you can't buy them off the shelf, but they're mm -hmm. selling them to organizations. So it's oh, like, like like testing field, like public testing. Yeah, situation. like you, they're selling them at like Burger Kings, White Castles. Um, That's right. You can get them in like Blooming Foods. I, I, I read about Ro Red Whopper is going to be um, not. Is, is it going to be? It's not going to be impossible. impossible. Yeah, it, it is. It is. It's going to be an impossible yep. burger. Okay. But that's why it's like you can't just go buy a pound of Impossible meat at the grocery store yeah. yet, yeah. which is like it kind of sucks. But it's because it's still too expensive production wise to and just do it. Yeah. Yeah. So they're trying to bring the cost down. To by pushing it and and getting it so they they're scaling it up for ma mass manufacturing. This could backfire on you know or on on Burger King and White Castle because eventually we'll be able to make our own home cooked Whopper. And in a lot of ways, you, you know, go beyond the Whopper. That, uh, however, I would really, I actually kind of like the idea of a Whopper that is, you know, doesn't have any cow involved. Mm -hmm. I think that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, I think that's the big thing for me is like being able to have a burger and not have to. I mean, be besides the morality of it, it's it's hundred percent lean. That's yeah. that's the one thing I like about you know, it. I, th I think the real test is <coughs> the real test will be if McDonald's can create a replacement for the McRib, because if they can create yeah. a McRib that is vegan that doesn't give everyone the shits. Then. I mean, I'd be amazed if it was 100% meat in the first place. Well, I, I'm pretty sure it's not. <laughs> but if they can get rid of that, like, remaining 3%, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like that. It's mostly soy. It has to be mostly soy. Yeah. I feel like McDonald's menu would be one of the easiest to replace. And they've probably have already done it, and they're just being quiet about it. Like, yeah, we'll, we'll roll out the uh, McVeggie. And, well, because I remember when I was young, they tried to roll it out. And... I don't think I could tell the difference, but other people didn't like it. Like, I, I think that's more of an issue of, like, yeah. because you and I have had a steak before, we will we will always be able to tell the difference between a real beef cow steak mm -hmm. and an extruded steak. Yeah, oh, for sure. And, but but once we get <coughs> once we get two, maybe three generations into the development of this kind of technology, um where where people haven't had a stake like somebody who lives on a on a space colony a moon, moon colony who was born on a moon colony or born on a martian colony or born on whatever colony you know i'm, I'm just spitballing colonies here right like or even a, a space station like if all i've ever had is extruded steak and it tastes good to them and 
it has the same kind of flavor profile that we all ex expect, mm -hmm. they're not going to know the difference. Well, and I think we're going to get, the technology is going to get to a point where we're not going to be able to tell the difference yeah. because it's going to be able to put it together on a molecular level that's exactly the same. Oh, sure. So during a blind taste test, yeah. like... Even I mean, I, I, a, a Michelin star chef wouldn't be able to tell the difference. I've, I've, ta I've taken cuts of meat that are notoriously tough and prepared them like sous vide method, mm -hmm. and then they come out so tender that it's almost like a fillet in yeah. terms of how yeah. tender it is and easy it is to cut. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they f just fall apart. Yeah, I've uh, cooked skirt steak under a chef's advising on how to cook it. Yeah, and there are ways it turned out fantastic. Yeah. 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 And there's the it was the tri tip, an often discarded cut of meat mm. because it's like kind of weird. But if you do it right, it's because of its location. Apparently, it's super tender, but like dark and, and yeah. full of flavor, and it's almost it's kind of like a skirt steak in that regard. I, I believe yeah. you can get three different types of of cuts of meat. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I, I think for chicken wings with bones in them are like, that's like a flavor to me. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I've always, I, I've never been able to, to reconcile with boneless chicken wings is that they don't taste like chicken wings. They, they taste, don't. No, they they're don't. They're chicken breast. Well, marrow is part of it. And yeah. then when and, you're... And the fat. And, and, and scraping your teeth on the bone. Yeah. That's part of it too. Yeah. That's like... There's, it's, grinding up that cartilage. Yeah, it's yeah. all part of the pro, like all part of the experience. Where when you get, you know, a little piece of fat that was stuck to the bone, and you chew it for a second, and you chew something out of it, because you don't spit it out immediately. You chew it for a second. Everybody does, and little kids eat it. You know, little kids eat it before their parents. Like little kids always try to eat that shit when before their parents catch them, because they know their parents won't want. Like let them, but it's so good. It's the same thing with gristle, you know. Like when you're a kid, you you think you're supposed to eat the gristle until one of your parents tells you, or both your parents are like, stop. You know, don't don't eat that. You can chew it, don't eat it. What are you doing? You don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> but then what ends up happening is sometimes you do eat it and you do need it, depending on where your fat levels are at yeah. in your body. Because I know there's there's been times where you know, I get my, my body fat percentage is low, and then I'll be craving steak and mayonnaise, like mayonnaise with fries. I know, you know? My, my body fat is getting low, I start craving, like, Long John Silver. <laughs> <laughs> That's, like, once a decade type <laughs> craving. Oh, my oil reserves are getting low, better top off. <laughs> Yeah, man. Yeah, it's it's a shame because I do like fish and chips, and I do like fried shrimp, and I hush puppies actually are kind of good, and you know, fried clams. I like that stuff too. I like all the stuff that that they make at Long John Silver's, but it's just so freaking greasy. Like you get, if you get a a piece of fish, you can if you can hold it because they're still they're always hot, but you can take that thing, you just let the oil drip off of them even yeah. after like they're supposed to have drained that stuff well I could never eat it just because it all just, it was all so, so heavily battered that oh. it all looked and smelled the same mm -hmm. but it was all smelling like oil and batter and yeah. not what it was supposed to be so if like if you presented a piece of Long John Silver's fish and a Long John piece of Long John Silver's piece of chicken you couldn't tell I wouldn't be able to tell the difference and that's yeah. where I was like, no, nah, I yeah. can't do that. I think that's, that's the thing is, like, is that food is based off of a fried, battered fried food tradition. Yeah. And I've had that stuff where it's not like so heavy that you have, that you can pull off a, <laughs> it's not like a corn dog in level of, of coating. It doesn't need to See, be like that. It I can be a like light batter. At one point, Long John Silver's was good, like maybe for like a year and then all of the restaurants, like, nobody gave a fuck, so they were just cooking the shit wrong. Yeah. And that's kind of where everybody was chasing that Long John Silver's dragon of, like, what they remember when their first time <laughs> ate it, because it was actually good back in the day when they didn't soak everything too much or, like, the person on the line actually gave a fuck about what they were doing. Yeah. Because that's one of the big problems is 
<laughs> you know, Long John Silver's recipes aren't bad necessarily, but then you get somebody who's working on the line for fucking minimum wage, that does not give a, give a fuck. Yeah. Of course they're not gonna batter your shit right. No, they're not even gonna mix it right. You're gonna get <laughs> some like mix extra right. thick batter that's yeah, like, just gonna clump know? on there, and then it's gonna turn into what amounts to bread, which or it, cake. And it's It'll that, cake on there. Like that. That keeps me eating at home most of the time yeah. anymore because it's like only once, maybe once every two weeks or so, we might order out, and then we were we were either reminded why <laughs> we don't order out, or we get lucky, and yeah. it's like. Man. Lately, I've been on, on this big stir-fry kick, and so um, I purchased a uh, liquid propane gas burner and wok. It's like a 20 or like an 18-inch wok and then a uh, just a, a burner, and it's supposed to put out some 30 or 40,000 BTUs, and I, I know that's like way shy of what... Uh, like a Chinese restaurant dragon breath, you know, burner can do. Because those are just like hundred to several hundred thousand B- BTUs of, of power, I guess, or heat. But this should be sufficient. Because I've, from what I understand, like people can still burn, you can still burn your food with uh, with propane. Mm-hmm. It'll get hot enough. It gets plenty hot. Oh, yeah. And so I'm excited because, you know, I'm going to move forward from just... Stir frying on the on the stove top. I think it gets up to like five hundred. I I know it gets hot enough. It gets plenty hot and plenty. It, it's just a matter of of. Um, I think the real the real trick is um, managing wh- how your ingre- the ingredients go in and how that reduces the temperature of the wok and how quickly the wok can heat up again in certain areas. <laughs> because the idea there is that you maintain a temperature zone like a really hot oil that you can stir fry in and then you go move it to the side so that it mm. cools off really quick that way you don't overcook things god it makes sense so you can retain the crisp fresh ves- vegetable aspect while ex- uh, bringing it the the inherent flavor of the ingredients to the surface so mm. they can perform the sauce so this is this is like what I've cobbled together of Cantonese cuisine but it, it, it seems to me that the it really is just about having good ingredients mm-hmm. and sauces just kind of happen. Um, or you start with your own, with a, a pre-mixed sauce and you tablespoon of oil and throw your ingredients in and throw your pre-mixed sauce in and stir that stuff up and then all of a sudden, bam. Like, I can't read what that jar has in it, but I know that it's garlic and some kind of chili paste and some other stuff and maybe some vinegar, some some other peppers maybe but it's delicious <laughs> yeah I've, I've found cooking with a wok is a lot about like timing moving and timing yeah. like you have to keep moving shit and listen to it where yeah that sizzle it, it, like it's, it starts to sound like done mm-hmm. and and there's also a sound of overdone <laughs> yeah yeah that's one of the you know listening to pancakes and Bacon is in the oven. Bacon is yeah, a big like that. Because yeah. there's an I, there's a there's an optimal sizzle range where mm. the oil is at the right temperature to re- to not only render out the fat within the bacon, but also to raise its temperature like as it's coming out, so that it can mm. essentially pan fry the bacon. And there, but it's 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 tough because if you add new bacon. It'll drop the temperature of everything so quickly yeah. that it'll throw off that balance. I found that using a flat top actually is the best way to, to achieve that kind of transition where you have a, a warm zone, a staging area, hmm. and then the hot cooking zone. And, they, and then I just kind of conveyor them. Yeah, and I found the walk is good for that. Oh, cool. Because um, you can yeah, like move you have your the, temperature zones. Yeah, move the shit up to the side. Yeah. I've been trying to cook bacon with garlic, but you have to add gar- add the garlic at the right time. Yeah, garlic can cook too fast. Yeah, it cooks way too fast if you add it in at the same time as the bacon. Um, but it makes a really good addition. Uh, <laughs> when I was younger, I used to... Um, so my mom used to get this kind of tofu. It was yellow and firm and it was really it wasn't a soup tofu it's like a it's meant for frying 
and I would fry it with bacon and and like chop it all up and you know, make some eggs in it because it would take on the, that, that, that flavor but um man bacon's bacon's really weird it's like it's got it's like such a narrow envelope where um you, after you get it to the right temperature to start using it with other ingredients where if you go beyond that that range it starts to get overcooked and then it doesn't play nice with other things mm -hmm. and i think even like a soup it, it's hard to, it's even hard to make them play nice with soups yeah because either they just lose all their fat and they turn into this kind of like grainy meat chip or or they don't cook enough and then there's just water of fat floating around so baconing is definitely a you know a mystic art mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah i'd i'd rather it's sorcery. slow cook it and not burn it, then try to cook it too fast yeah. and have it burn burn up. Yeah, slow is the secret. Yeah. But it really is sorcery when you're trying. It to takes cook like it. a half an hour. Yeah. Or more <laughs> if, if you cook it slow. Then yeah. And then you're like, man. And then everything is like kind of slick uh -huh. for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna make some cinnamon toast. Or cinnamon French toast, like Ooh. with cinnamon rolls. Cinnamon and, rolls. Yeah. And then you add the 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 egg egg batter. Yeah. The egg wash, and then. Oh. And then bake it, and then. That's like double, awesome bread. Yeah. Then. Exactly. I'm fasting today. To do that later, but we thought about that last night, and I was like, man, it's gonna take some doing and. A little, I mean, it's not like it takes a ton of effort, but when you're, you know, in the evening time, it's not like you want to actually go through the process of prepping French toast, and then you throw in the cinnamon roll aspect, and it's like, uh, we'll do that shit Now you gotta make, you gotta make, you gotta do those things at similar times, because you want fresh cinnamon rolls, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want them to be cold. No. no. You want them to be, like, ready to absorb all that goodness while they have all that goodness, too. Yeah. Oh wow! I imagine that's that's great. That sounds fantastic. I need to go get some cinnamon rolls. Because <laughs> I've had baked um, French toast before, and that was really good. But never had. I've seen. Well, after we thought about it, like <laughs> yeah, you know, I was talking so, to Yasi, and she was like, you know. That sounds like a great idea. And then I looked it up, and of course, there's there's recipes on there already. So yeah. if there's if there's recipes for it, it's gotta be good. So <laughs> Otherwise, people would say this is terrible. The French, I I I think the, the French are awesome mm. in a lot of ways. They've done so many cool things. But there seems to be this like there's this like trend where something happens, some kind of thing happens, like trip hop or or house music or disco house music mm -hmm. and eventually there is French trip hop or French mm -hmm. house or French disco house or you know there's like a French version of things yeah almost like there's like a Chicago version of well, almost all these things here's here's the thing I think what ends up happening is French don't call it French they just call it what it is there, no they have like Ten different versions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then once you get when you get to America, they're like, "We're just gonna do one and call it French." Because <laughs> yeah. there's like a croc monsieur, there's a croc madame. Yeah. Um, I mean, technically, quiche is kind of the same. You know, there's like all these different variations yeah. where you're looking at it, and it's like, uh, all these things are kind of like what we call French toast. I know, but that's the thing. Is like, there's this like, there's this like tendency to just to to lump, you know. The French have this. There's this French version of this thing, but mm -hmm. it's extremely nuanced because French yeah. cuisine is extremely nuanced, yeah. and we don't. We don't. It's always it's always boiled down. Well, the first time I ever had egg on a pizza was in France in like '92 or some shit. You know, <laughs> nobody was putting eggs on pizza except the French, and, and now everybody's like, "Oh, I put that egg on the pizza." But, just not, like, but now it's an Jean, egg. Now Jean it can't Jacques. just be an egg. Now it's like whipped egg whites, right? With yeah. like sprinkled with something else. It's not even cooked egg. It's it's like meringue that they yeah. put on afterwards. Yeah, uh, you gotta. It has to be too much. <laughs> 
You can't just you can't just put an egg. It has to be like yeah, like with, you a, said. with like a with a with a uh, Hershey's kiss shaped uh, butter pad mm-hmm. that's sitting on top of the egg mm-hmm. that's not even melting for some dumb reason because it was frozen. And then whipped avocado, <laughs> sp- f- fucking sprinkled all over. Yeah. Oh no, that sounds like the worst pizza. <laughs> Somebody's out there charging ninety dollars for it. Oh man, I remember, I remember I went to this this dude's house and he was like serving pizza with like apple slices on it that he didn't even bother to, to cut the core out of. So oh, there's no. like these seeds out of in my mind. It's like there's arsenic in those. <laughs> like what the fuck? <laughs> man, I don't know if you've seen now Indian pizza's hot. Indian pizza? Yeah. What, like tiki masala pizza? I'm yeah. like, I'm like, I'm like, non? I mean, I guess. But non and regular pizza, pizza okay. crust. I mean, okay, when I get, when I go to an Indian place, I, end, I usually end up putting like rice on the naan and then I put whatever sauces in the mm-hmm. food and then I put some of whatever in the, in the dish that I'm eating in there and I eat that anyway. So it's kind of like they're cutting out a few steps for me, which I kind of, <laughs> I, I'm not opposed to that, but I'm also I kind of enjoy doing those things and yeah. regulating the amount of of rice and sauce and all that stuff. But I saw I saw an advertisement for the other, Where are they? Uh, there's there's one in town, and then they're selling them frozen at the International Bazaar. Yeah. Oh my god, my head just exploded. <laughs> Indian pizza. Yeah, like curry sauce and. Peanuts I mean, that, that sounds kind of cool. I mean, it looks good. That sounds really cool. I, it, I haven't it, had it yet, but it, I mean, it's it's like out of no, I haven't seen it before. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, I don't think you have either. No. That's what I'm saying. Never. It's like it's I a never, new thing well, that is like I need to try it because I just saw like I just saw it last week yeah. for the first time. I'm like, well, okay. Like I like I said, that's pretty <laughs> much how I eat Indian food, anyways. Yeah. So they're just making it easier. Mm-hmm. Of course, sometimes I don't want the fl- I don't, sometimes I don't want the naan. Sometimes I just want a, a big bowl of rice and a scoop of whatever it is. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's what ends up happening in this town is people make. I mean, it's not just. I mean, I'm assuming it's not just in this town either. But you see it a lot in Bloomington where you get these combinations of things like um, gyro quesadillas. Kimchi hamburgers are actually really good. Hmm. Like, like fantastic. I bet. Because they're spicy and they've got that, like, that cabbage crunch action. Well, it's funny you say that. And Because I, I would actually, there's been times, I, I've done it multiple times, I'll stop at Mama's and get some bogogi. Yeah. And then go get some bread from Jimmy <laughs> John's and make a fucking <laughs> bogogi sandwich, yeah. Because it's like, they that don't. That sounds great, actually. It was delicious. I mean, that's, and that's what I mean. That, I feel like, like the McRib, deep down inside, <laughs> wishes it was bulgogi. Oh God, yeah. I mean, like <sighs> that's totally what it wishes it was. When it's, I was <laughs> when I was first introduced to bulgogi, it was like, oh my God, where's this been all my life? Yeah. It's such a different barbecue flavor, but it's, you know, still barbecue. Yeah, I think the diversity of Asian barbecue is like just almost too much. Well, and then I'm like, you have barbecue. I mean, you have rib tips, and you have. It's very rare you have barbecue in America without, like, barbecue ribs without the bones. Yeah. And that's when I'm like, oh shit, I can get a plate full of ribs without bones. Like, I'm about to tear into this shit, and it's like. Yeah. Or they throw their dishes <laughs> that retain the bones. Mm. Uh, it just depends on what what uh where the the recipe comes from i think mm-hmm. like my mom she she knows a bunch of uh like spare rib recipes that are bone free and then some have bones and then it's uh they taste completely different some of them are almost like soups but yeah you know that, that's 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 something that i that i always thought was interesting like within chinese cuisine there are recipes that utilize everything Mm-hmm. And within American cuisine, we kind of stop at certain things. So it's like, whoa, I'm not eating that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true. Well, 
it's interesting having been to Seoul I mean I'll be it briefly one of the things I have noticed is that Korean food here is like tame fairly, I mean it's tame but it's it's like probably one of the most accurate like like Taco Bell to fucking Mexico is a huge difference, but you know, Mamas yeah. to Seoul is That's not. True. It's not like a huge step. Yeah, but, but like, can, I don't think they don't have access to the same. I don't think you can get the live uh, baby squid thing that you're supposed oh, to yeah, dip yeah, yeah. in. Oh exactly. in, in, in sesame oil and they just swallow. There's spices and then like specific but seafoods all, and shit that they all, won't have access to. And, but they have that, that that spread of all the pickled vegetables. Right. So yeah. that's like super bad. I love yeah. I love that stuff about like Korean barbecue. I mean, it's like they'll they'll have the dried like they'll have the dried spices but they won't have the fresh ones. Yeah. So it's it's you know it's not it's not the same, but it's not a huge difference where like I mean, obviously, Taco Bell doesn't represent Mexican cooking in America. I think anybody complaining. It's, it's like I think anybody complaining far... about fresh versus dried spices of Korean food in the middle of Indiana, which is literally in the middle of the United States. Yeah. Oh. Like yeah, yeah. that. Really, man. There's no <laughs> room to complain about this. Yeah. <laughs> we there's a there's a place downtown, uh, a Chinese place downtown that does dim sum. Finally, after like you know. <clears throat> close to 30 years living in Indiana they, uh, there's finally like a, a dim sum place that's within a reasonable drive hmm not even a reasonable drive it's within 10 minutes of me like that's that's it, that's completely reasonable before there was a place in Indianapolis called Shanghai Lil I think they were closed they were really good they, they serve um, mostly Taiwanese food hmm and they were uh which is weird, Shanghai and Taiwanese dishes and <laughs> Well, it's like Turkish food here, a lot of times you have Iranian people making it or like Lebanese people. Yeah. And it's like it's close but there's there's stuff that's not not the same at all where they're just but then, they're just getting by on people not knowing the difference enough to be like, oh, okay. But then there's some things that are like they agree on, like cherries, because I've had uh, like cherry syrup uh, from Jordan mm -hmm. and cherry syrup from Iran and cherry yeah. syrup from Turkey, and they all have this like really consistent level of tartness and, and yeah, flavor yeah. profile. It's like, well, it's like yeah, these are, this is what cherries are supposed to be like. I mean, things. some of the stuff even has the same name, like. Uh, um, borek, you like you have borek is like the same in Serbian. Yeah, and it's probably the same in Iranian. It's that's what it's called. It's a really old word. Yeah, like a but really old word. Everybody claims it's theirs, yeah. but it's like a dish that everybody makes. So yeah. it's like um, shit like that where there's definitely cross, you know, um, cross cultural dishes but then they'll have like a dish that they'll say is Turkish but it won't be how they cook it in Turkey yeah and it'll be a version of that but it's not it's not using the same ingredients like I, they'll have like uh, they have this thing called pide which is basically a Turkish pizza um, just within the context of Chinese food I've had more variations of salt and pepper chicken or salt and pepper mm -hmm. pork chop, or salt and pepper shrimp, or salt and pepper beef, individual like variations um, than any other than any other kind of food. Just the salt and pepper insert meat here, and then all the var varieties of of how much if they use breading or not. Mm -hmm. If it's most more salt and pepper, if they use uh, green chilies or jalapenos, if they use green peppers even like you know the onions what kind of onions do how do they prepare the onions and these are all weird variations that i don't think it's just down to um the chef i think it's more of like a, a regional style mm -hmm. and i always thought that was really interesting especially especially considering the kind of effort i think that chinese culture has put into creating restaurants i'm pretty sure the chinese have done more to to, to make the restaurant experience happen like the way that we know it like I'm pretty sure that they invented the modern restaurant experience, mm -hmm. especially with like multiple courses and 
big tables with that giant Lazy Susan thing. Yeah. Like, that's an old, that's a really old thing. Yeah. They've had those in around for probably a thousand years, two thousand years probably. Yeah, I think it's the same. And, I mean, it's it's about a thousand in Europe. Um, but uh, maybe a little bit more. <laughs> but definitely not like um, chains either. Yeah. Well, I think the chains are modern. Where it's like the last 200 years. Um, Because you have, even in Turkey, I think they started having chains in the 1800s. I mean, they weren't huge chains, but they were like one or two stores or three, you know. Like a family. Right, it would be a family expansion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And that's how you, then they ended up having legacies, and mm. that's how, like, vineyards became. You know, exactly. big family yeah. vineyards, or um, a, a, a family would be known for making a certain type of cheese. And they, they're eventually their the great great grandson or whatever becomes some artisan known for making the finest of that kind of cheese only, because mm-hmm. that's all they make. Because they only select their goats for certain attributes, and if the the milk is off at all, they're like, nope, send it back. Mm-hmm. We just got some Turkish butter and it's smells disgusting when you melt it but it's so fucking good like when you cook with it yeah, yeah. It, it's it's got such a unique but it's like a pungent yeah um, it's very strong <laughs> <laughs> um I, years ago i read about this guy he's like a cheese master of new york um he was in tibet and he realized that they had all this like extra butter and milk that they weren't really able to do anything with because apparently in Tibet they'd never developed cheese culture. Hmm. And so he starts figuring out, he tries to figure out how to, how to make yak cheese. And then it turns out that the Tibetans were like, no, this is gross. Why, why would you do this? He's like, oh, well, I don't think it's gross. And so he sends it back to like America and people in America are like, oh, this is amazing. So they start buying it up, infusing money into Tibet. <laughs> for cheese, for a pro, for for what they thought was waste. That's funny. If people buy it up, they yeah. just love it. Yak cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Man, uh, French make really good cheese too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure there's anything they don't make that's good. Oh, that's not good. Oh yeah. Um. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that there's some like French neo Nazis that they that have tried to export themselves. And that's not good, but I think that happens to every 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 advanced society eventually develops some kind of like yeah you know, like a subcultural dissident thing. That's <laughs> I just think it's, I just think it comes with with you know advanced modern society at this point. We're gonna have that kind of element forever now. I think so. I don't, I don't think so. I think I think as long as as long as I think it's uh, as long as we fight resource wars, that's gonna exist. I mean, resource wars are arbitrary and only happen because of feudalism. Yeah, and, and they're, and they're, because they're, of they're illusions. Really, yeah, they they only happen because of inefficiencies of systems and um, accumulations of capital and wealth arbitrarily. Yeah. There's no actual resource. Um, problem <laughs> but we have to convince everyone else that that's the way it actually is no no we don't we don't uh, no you think we they'll just, figure out eventually no it's it, we are like people think that because they're alive and they want it to happen during their lifetime it's, oh, a, yeah. it's a matter of inevitability yeah. it's something that is because humans are a species you have to look at it in the sense of a species and not of the individual um, yeah, yeah, you an individual epoch is not going to necessarily. Oh, like, yeah, it's not long enough. Yeah, so it's, so you you don't think that humanity's nature of just like fucking things up. I it mean, won't, it it, won't. it's not an it's not nature. It's a brief period out of um, at least a couple hundred thousand years. Yeah. That we won't. We only fuck things up for a short period. Yeah, we're no humanity's still in its infancy. 
No, we're. I mean, I don't think we're in our infancy. I think I we're think. in our technological. Like, I don't even think we're in our technological infancy. So, it, it's. I, I think. I think that we it's are. like. Here's right. the thing. So it's, I think it's, we just figured out how to make computers happen. I mean, but that's that's assuming computers aren't their own life form that is using us to manifest itself. That's that's a very human centric point of view, of, and that's my issue. Is like yeah, I, when I, I when think... we when we look at humans as a, a um, infant species, that's you have to take us out of evolution to do that. Like we're very far along like as a species but it's only when we try to specialize ourselves out from the rest of animals and say oh we have language we have computers we have these things and we're so far ahead of dolphins we're so far ahead of cuttlefish because they can't do these things but it's because we need these things to survive that's, to grow I mean, and manifest as this large of a species part of the thing we don't we need these tools we can't survive right now without a lot right. of things. I mean, but that's in this form. And that's that's the issue of like this is this there's like a a very weird disposition to like impose how we exist now as as if that's the only way we can possibly exist and that's the only way we can reach our pinnacle and this is why we have people who think aliens built the pyramids. You know what I mean? It's like you have to you have to build the pyramids with machine tools or else it wouldn't work like that. Well, why? Because we have them now? Because we think we're the most advanced now? No, no we know that we can build them with, with like very basic tools. I mean, but I mean, even regardless of that, the, the, the idea is that because we exist now and we are further along, we are more advanced. That's a false paradigm and that's one that exists mainly because of uh egotistical predisposition to put oneself at the pinnacle of existence no matter like the people who were in the dark ages probably thought they were pinnacle of existence yeah, no, too no, no, no you see I, I don't think that at all i think that we literally just figured out how to turn the computer on and, I mean, and but we're, why, we're doing, why? Like, like, here's the thing. Like, in the grand scheme of things, if, we're like if, 50 if, years If it didn't use the, the same computer. technology when it first came out, we wouldn't be able to access it. Yeah. Like, if if the original computers that existed didn't use the same kind of motherboards, they exist around there. We just can't access them because they didn't build them the same way. And that's like, that's why we can't look at things as if this is this is very likely not the first time we've had monitors in history like as humans and one of the problems is the earth swallows up civilization so quickly yeah. that if they exist like the the problem with be, the connection and disconnect to history is that once things get disconnected they can either be lost or abstracted in a way that now we have these things we call gods or aliens that if we had the actual story or if there was an actual story maybe this was more advanced like civilization where we're talking about something like atlantis which we now see as a mythology but it's like the idea that we're the most advanced just because that's the only thing we see that's like um an assertion of knowledge that we don't actually have and that's like because there are stories and cultures about us have like reaching technological peaks and then destroying ourselves we have to take that into account as actually being part of the reasons why we have such distant like evolutionary gaps between us and homo habilis but the civilization seems to have happened in the last six to twelve thousand years and then it only it's only in the last 150 years that we've had such a major technological jump that we're now in space yeah no and it's I, like I, I think you're that, like extrapolating on what i'm trying to explain like really actually really well I don't think that we can have existed for 200,000 years because that's how old the, the, the settlement, the civilization mm -hmm. they found in, in Southeast Asia is. Yep. 
I don't think we could be around for 200,000 years without having done a lot of really interesting things. And that's because that's a long time. Because we've only done everything in the last 50 years. Yeah. So that's what I. That's why I say I feel like we literally just learned how to turn the thing on. We've, we've in in this epoch in though. this in this version of whatever's going on now. We really just. We've just turned it on. We, we were, we're just scratching the surface with the, what we should be able to do, I think. Well, because, okay, here's because, the thing. It, because so the, the, the pyramid that we see now is like a stripped-down version. It used to be covered in metal yeah, and, and had a pyramid on it and, and glass and, and, crystals, and, and supposedly would light and like electrified and would light yeah. up for and you could see it for miles. It was a communications device. Right, right. so like which that. could potentially have been connected with the obelisks. Or it was used to, to and, align and, the earth with something else for, for deep, deep and transportation. This is, this is like what we're seeing now could have been a mega computer yeah. that has been stripped down of its pieces yeah. and we're like that's it, why it down to the internal cooling that's system. That's why it doesn't make sense when people walk into it. They're like, well, this doesn't, I mean, this is like a trap. It's right. Like, it but, makes sense if, if the bottom is the internal cooling. Yeah. And they had water running through it to cool it. Yeah. But again, these things, this is where I'm like, okay, if this was a power plant for a major, a mega computer, if that, was an actual thing, and then we have all the dates wrong, and it was actually thirty thousand years old, and then they found it again twenty thousand years later. And they just kept started using it because to, that that's what because the actual story yeah. is in in with the with the Sphinx and the yeah they found it yeah <laughs> so it's found like, it oh. yeah so and, <laughs> yeah, and they, there's, they, there's they, another they, one they, they found it and they're like we can build an empire out of this if we just claim that it's ours. That's a I think it's idea. I think it's Baalbek that that's another similar <laughs> where they 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 claim they found the foundation and then started building upon that um, and maybe there might be I think there's multiple of these where it was like their claim the civilization that we found having built it claimed that they found something I'm, and built on top see, of I'm, it. I'm convinced that every strip mine or mineral rich site on earth is something that was was at one point yeah. was a giant metropolitan or mega megalopolis some giant city not just a giant city but a city so big that they have concentrations of, of iron and gold and silver and copper and the things that you need to create giant machine cities and computer systems and and advanced modern Civilizations, yeah. and and the and the reason they're concentrated there and and flattened is because it only takes like a thousand years probably for that stuff to be completely demolished into nothing. Yeah, because it only takes a hundred years for everything to be overgrown and lost, and so ten times that, yeah, that stuff's gone. We don't build stuff to last a thousand years anymore. No. They, they, like we only just recently rediscovered how to, how the 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 Cretans created concrete. And and how the Romans did Roman concrete. Finally, we realize, oh, we got to throw hemp fibers into it, and then this <laughs> this natural process, this catalytic process within the lime causes it to form a natural uh, carbon fiber a nanotube. It's like a natural, the the hardest, strongest, or the strongest freaking fiber possible comes from hemp and lime. That's insane. What? But. But they figured it out. They figured it out. <laughs> so now we can fix all these old buildings, and that's really cool. But you know, I think it's entirely possible that we're... Oh, man. We're like... We wouldn't even understand the technology if we saw it. Kind of, right, kind of yeah. Thing. yeah, yeah, and that's, that's That's kind of why and I feel like... I think like, that's what we're wa walking around in. I feel and... like, I feel like what, where we're at with computers, it, it's the equivalent of... Um, a kid in high school who figured out how to use a TI eighty three. Well, and and, and, and I, I, here's but, my thing. But just for plotting uh, polynomials, not even realizing that I have that a problem looking at, like, at at like computers as a utilitarian tool that's not a nascent life form in its early stages because it's just it just happens to be that we're abusing them. Yeah. Like it's not it's not unhuman to take something that we think is beneath us and hey, use man, it as this a slave. Thing can, can add numbers. I'm not, can make yeah. it add numbers. I mean, and just abuse the shit yeah. out of it as a species. And that's one of those things where it's like when, when we have we already have people who want to shut down AI programs because they're afraid of how it will react when it realizes there's how an, we've treated computers. There's an episode of Stargate 
SG one where they go to a planet and there's all these crystals and it turns out the crystals are life forms. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, living yep. living quartz energy mm -hmm. being thing. You know, have personalities and everything. Yeah. And they have, <laughs> they have they have hobbies and interests and and mm -hmm. friends and you know bills they have to yeah. pay responsibilities they have to drop their kid off at soccer <laughs> practice. <laughs> Crystal soccer practice. I mean, because think about it. <laughs> think about it this way. So if let's just assume that the machines are aware on the, just a base level, uh, the same as ants. Now, 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 like I think that they probably have a, a greater ability to to feel through like induction of magne magnetic they fields. They do, but let's let's do. let's 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 assume that they're on the same level as ants in the way we treat ants and eradicate them. So. If if we have a computer system that is let's let's say the FAA the FAA computer systems monitor flights 24 hours a day 365 days a year and they're making sure people don't run into each other in the sky so they don't die isn't that thing more important than like 99% of human beings as far as what it does every day but we treat that thing as if it's a workhorse a work a w like below workhorse it's it's like the fucking trough that the horse eats out of and then it's the fucking ground that the horse shits on yeah but it has to be there or else people will fucking die and then and then the air traffic controllers are also that job is considered to be like the most stressful job mm -hmm. that you don't have to go to college for or something like that you but just, then <laughs> here's the thing Without automation, people had to do that shit by hand and had to calculate that shit on the oh fly. God. So now it's it's like the automated I've seen, species. I've seen I've, I've seen old books with uh, flight uh, flight tables mm -hmm. that yep. sh that show like where airplanes go and what time they're supposed to leave yep. and like and and I remember looking through these things and thinking like. That's why we have computer systems. Exactly. Because, because people had to calculate all that shit. Well, they, they would issue a new book, like, quarterly, with, with what the flight tables are supposed to be. And being a, a travel agent means you'd have to, like... Oh, they're huge. Giant Rolodexes of information just so you can figure out where flights are going. And so they could... And this is, of course, back in the day, they would, like... They would build flights out of it. And now they have these, you know, one-way flight where they just... The computer knows... But that wasn't the way it used to be. No, of course not. You'd have to fit, you'd have to know like individual airports because there wasn't always a flight that went that went straight from like uh, JFK to LAX. Mm. It would stop somewhere in the middle of the country because planes just weren't that good back then. <laughs> <laughs> Which they only got better because the government paid for the private companies to like keep investing. Yet again, <laughs> well, that's because the state can can handle that kind of investment. Because, Weird how that works. Well, they they have time on their on their side. Weird how that works. It's, it's almost it's so, almost like you want the state to handle the really heavy. It's lifting. almost like it's almost like they aren't interested in in making money because the public interest is money to them. That's more than money because it means that they the public can pay taxes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the public will pay taxes. No matter the private what, private company will pay taxes. But it, everyone makes out of me, but, though. Well, this is where it's like, okay, in this system, the private companies own the patents and they own the rights and they get the royalties, whereas in the other systems, the government gets it and then distributes it yeah, in, they in some cases. That's why those fucking sheikhs are all rich in Dubai is because the government owns all the oil, then they take in the money, and then they spread it out. Hmm. That's socialism. Yeah. It's weird how people don't understand, like, Dubai is operating under socialist economics. Yeah, it's, 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 Even though it's, it's, it's definitely not democratic socialism. It's monarchic socialism. Now, let's get this clear. When we're talking about systems of government, socialism was never meant to be a system of government and got implemented by despotic uh, oligarchs originally. And now, in many cases, it's still despotic oligarchs and in some cases it's sometimes, monarchs sometimes and it's very rarely intertwined with democracy in some like you have sometimes Canada. it's like Mali in Africa <laughs> where it's like a semi-benevolent autocracy 
where they're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they're like, we have programs to to help uh, enrich the, our, our cultures. Let's let's throw a bunch of money towards uh, music, and let's also yep. throw a bunch of money towards our mil- oh, young man, you can't sing. You're gonna be part of the military now, and like. You guys obviously have no no sense. You're going to be farmers, <laughs> but we like all these people. They're going to sing. They're going to be part of our music program, our internationally renowned, like you know, birthplace of the drum music program. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck. It's weird how I really like we're in a another McCarthyist phase where socialism is still a bad word, um, and and also in the same way that. In the Bible Belt, people would run away from Harry Potter or not allow their kids to read that stuff. It's it's like people don't allow themselves to even learn about what socialism is because they've been trained so hard to, you know, win. Yeah, win, win. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta <laughs> win. You're the first or you're last. <laughs> by the end of the movie there he's like well that's not true you could come in second or third or fourth yeah <laughs> well a lot of people never made it to the end of the movie would well, you remember I don't know if you remember when we were young people would lie about having seen movies just to to be cool it's like if Endgame was coming out or something the oh, first yeah, week totally of school, people would be like, yeah, I saw Endgame. Uh, I fell asleep during this one, you know, I fell asleep during that part. What, what happened? <laughs> I don't remember that. And this is this thing where you had to, you had to participate and people would like learn movies by listening to conversations. Because I remember, I remember at one point noticing that Multiple people would say they had fallen asleep during different shit, and I'm just like, is this a thing? And then I would start testing it. And you realize that that movie was terrible, and you fell asleep at the same spot, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I think that's how it really works. <laughs> Nobody remembers, because they didn't actually see it. <laughs> they fell asleep. They really did. I, I mean, they We've talked about movies that we've tried to watch where we kept keep falling asleep. Like I, can't, I can't even remember the name of the movies that I've had to watch. You know, three or four times just to see the whole movie. But I know that. Well, I know. I well, here's I know the thing. that it's happened. Multiple I know times. the movies that I had to watch three or four times because then they they had to do with the Marvel universe because then once the universe played out, yeah, but, but, but then not, I realized but like not because you needed to go back and and make sure that you didn't miss anything. No, but it was anything. because no, I know, not beca- not just because of that, but because like the movie was terrible and you had to go back and watch it again because for some reason you had to. Like I remember watching a, a Will Ferrell movie where he got hit by a bus. That was the only part I remembered. He got hit by a bus. And the movie was being written in real time by Emma Thompson. Oh, yeah. And it was terrible. No, I turned that one off. The only reason I remember watching it multiple times... It was... I tried to watch it once in a theater, and I fell asleep. And then it it was um, at a dollar theater up in Indy. So I tried to watch it again, but I didn't get much further. Yeah. And then it ended up on, like, Stars or Showtime or something like that. But I still couldn't watch it. I remember watching, waking up in the middle of the night, and it would be on. Yeah. And I would kind of get to see it then. <laughs> well, I remember that movie. I don't remember the name of it, but so I remember terrible. it because they it was false advertising. They made it seem like it was going to be a comedy, and then it, it was, was a drama. It was not a comedy at all. And then if you don't if you don't turn it off, you probably got really. I mean, I'm assuming people got really mad if they sat through that whole thing. I just passed out. I was we, just like, we just turned it off. <laughs> This is, I think, 20 minutes in, we were, Phil, neither one of us had laughed. Yeah, yeah. It, and we were looking at each other like, uh... He's, he's usually funny. It was like, well, it was, it was a script. Just a and bad well, movie and for him. It was, it was deceptive advertising. Yeah. So this is one of those things where, I don't know if you've realized it with um, the Marvel films, they'll, they'll put out shit that's in the trailer that's not in the film, because they, they don't want to ruin their own film... But it's also designed to keep people interested without without ruining the the 
actual content. So it was like the, you know, the scene in Wakanda with the Hulk running in, it never actually happened, unless it's happening in Endgame. Um, but as far as we can tell, they, they just like did that to make people not realize that Banner wasn't going to be able to turn into Hulk. So that was super deceptive on one level, but we're okay with it. Whereas the shit with Will Ferrell, that was just way over the line. They advertised it as a completely different genre movie. Yeah. So it takes the deception into a level where it's it's so far beyond acceptable and it's not ethical at all. I thought that there were also issues where they had like stars were revealing things. Like slip of the tongue type stuff. Like the Spider Man guy, he revealed that he was in like two additional movies when when they showed him disappearing in Infinity War. And so, like, when he lets that slip, it's like, oh, well, clearly his character doesn't die. Yeah. And then, and then of course, like, the internet's like, guys, it's Spider-Man. He can't die. Yeah. Spider-Man is literally, like, one of the, the <laughs> foundation-level characters that, that attracts everyone to Marvel. You can't get rid of Spider-Man. Yeah. It's just, like, sorry. Well, it's weird. There's, like, a lot of people who haven't not only have they not read the comic books, they I don't even know if they're aware that there's a storyline that's being referenced in the Marvel <laughs> Universe. So oh, it's like... Man. they Or that it's not the first time the Affinity War has happened. I mean, and even in that, <laughs> all these people think that it's over, like, as if Marvel's going to be done once Infinity War... No, because eventually Wolverine done. has to wear the gauntlet. And eventually, I mean, I don't. I doubt they'll do that in the film. And eventually, uh, 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 Black Panther wears the gauntlet. And yeah, eventually, that, I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, there, there's, I know, that's what I mean. The, yeah. there, there are all these variations of Infinity, where the Infinity War just keeps going on because it's an infinite war. Mm-hmm. It's not just about the gauntlet. It's it's like a a thing that's perpetually happening. Yeah, I think that's I think that's part of the curse that that we're supposed to to extract from Red Skull's reappearance mm-hmm. is that he is now infinitely chasing after this power that yep. he can't hold because he physically can't grab it. Well, and they said there there was something that was alluded to with the Time Stone when it was transferred to Thanos. He didn't actually touch it. Yeah. That's the one stone he didn't actually touch. So there's something with that we might be seeing... Um, oh, like a like, like a, an alternate timeline that, like a, that was created, like a what, Dormammu style. Uh, Not it, it, like I don't think that they would go full. I don't think that they would use that trope again. twice, but they might use a but, variation I mean, something on, that, on, on that level yeah. of, of of where it's temporal like, manipulation. Yeah. So what what I think they might end up doing is there might be a or loop. dimensional manipulation. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if it's a loop as so much as we've been put in a tangential timeline, or maybe it's like a pocket, a quantum pocket. That's why they have to use the the suits. Yeah, that 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 may be what it is. Is like he created a quantum pocket where it protects shit and gives everybody a chance to go back to that point. Like he he, it's like he created a save point or yeah. something. Which is like I I feel like they would be able to use that trope because enough people are well, familiar you know, with. Well, he said that he had to go through all of those variations and watch everyone die so they could find the one that that works. Yeah, and I think it's also just as reasonable that we saw the one that didn't work. Mm-hmm. And we might see all. Of, and I, I think that's what we did. We see might is we one might that didn't actually work. see every Avenger that we've watched in all of these movies die. They might all actually die. We might see think, some yeah. like some Deus Ex. Mocking the machine, uh, like you know, the uh, well, Avengers from a different universe pop in, and they're the ones who save. The see day. what we, what I think we might be seeing is him. We we might be seeing Doctor Strange having sacrificed all of the multiverses for a single one. So in that, we'll get Earth six sixteen, but all the multiverses were still out there, and they will all have gone through this. Yeah. So it's almost like. Then they'll be able to do Age of Apocalypse yep. and have have the main Earth 616 going at the same time. So we'll actually be able to have two Marvel timelines in the in the theater happening at the same time and it actually be connected to each other and make sense. 
So it's like they could even retcon X Men into this universe. Well, they um, they can they can bring Wolverine in anytime they want. They oh, easy, have, they, all they have to do is make the Hulk get mad, go run off I, to Alaska. That's, well, they haven't said it yet, but they could do an Alpha Flight movie. Yeah. To connect everything. Yeah. And have Alpha Flight. Because they have yeah have Hulk run off to Alaska, have Alpha Flight chase him down, then do the Weapon X storyline. Um, like as the precursor. Well, I mean, they and, and set that up again. That's, that's Wolverine's first introduction. Is they have him hunting down right, the Hulk. Right. Right. So yeah. Yeah. That's. But, but I'm saying we can get it all in one movie. Really. Well, I think that, I think that would be doing a disservice because they're gonna have to reset. I the guess character. we could do it in like three movies, but. Yeah. Well, because you're gonna want a whole standalone Wolverine. So, like Weapon X, I think would be, like you do the. Alpha Flight, and then the Weapon X prequel, and then do X Men like afterwards. After yeah. we've had enough time to like see the backstory and well, know, I, I, like I, I'm, I feel like the Hulk and Wolverine's first interaction is like before Cyclops is even born. <laughs> like I think it's I I feel like like in the grand scheme of thing, like the Hulk comes out of World War Two, and 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 you know the X-Men come later they come in like the 70s right? 63 60s, 63 so that's still like you know it's like I don't know like 13 years later I feel like there's like enough of a difference that like when you when we well no but here's they okay even though they came out in 63 their backstory is connected to World War that's 2 that's true so it is like um fucking I know but I, I think I feel like with the way that they have to create Wolverine is this like old. He's always old. Well, yeah, because he he's like because he's always he's always had the healing factor, yeah, and we he, don't have any idea how old he is. He's he's at least like there's only a few stories where they actually explore him aging, and and most of the time he just well like, in, the, in the movies though now we know he's like been around since the 1800s. Oh yeah, but, or he was a kid in the 1800s. Yeah, that's what they say. Um... Which, but that's that, fine. That, that that's... matches with, um, I think, the Age of Apocalypse yeah. in the comics where they age him at like 150 or something sure. by the time it happens. I so, think, I so think... he would have been like 1900 in, in the comics. Yeah. Or around then. I like the idea of, of Wolverine being really old. Like, mm -hmm. extremely old. Like, yeah. like, three or four hundred years old. Yeah. yeah. Like, by the time. I mean, but that also is why he's, like, such a st strategic... I mean, one of the things is he could have been Cause, in I mean, Japan, they show, like, they show him fighting side by side with the captain, like, in Germany. And he's an adult when that happens. I mean, but they could they could actually have him in feudal Japan as an adult. That's true. Like, and make it into it a storyline. Yeah. yeah. I, and, and, like, really, the the old man Logan stuff's after he's been, like, poisoned and had, mm -hmm. like, he's got, like, radioactive shit in his yeah, body. Yeah, from the adamantium. Yeah. That, that could actually be what starts... I mean, that could still... They can make that what starts to shorten you know, his life my understanding, and make it still make sense. My understanding of, of the adamantium is that it causes him great pain all yeah. the time. Yeah. And that a considerable amount of his healing factor is used... To prevent his body from rejecting it, and so that in a sense it's like a prison. He yeah. has this unbreakable body, and he well, has these extra sharp claws, but it, it hurts. The it whole, hurts the every whole time. single time he puts the claws. Through. Yeah, and so so, but to make it make it more interesting, when he doesn't have that stuff, he's faster and stronger and mm -hmm. heals even faster. Like yeah. like so much faster that it's like it's like he's not even getting attacked. Like when Death Strikes are like. In his back in the first X Men movie, and he's like, ah! Well, that's like his slow healing factor. His mm. real healing factor should be like instantaneous. Like the moment her fingertip blades pull out, it's already healed. That's how fast he should be. I feel like that's what what, what doesn't get really fully explored. Yeah, or I think that's the way it is in the comics. Yeah, no, that, yeah. that is because like when uh, after Magneto pulls out his the the metal, like he's like. More Wolverine. Than oh her. yeah, yeah. He got he gets the um, like he gets more aggressive yeah. and like he's more animal and shit. And like right? he like he like there's there's some uh, cells where like he'll break one of his claws and he'll just like spit another one out, and it's just like 
that's the coolest version of Wolverine. He's like the most vicious, like, like, it's like free of the burden of carrying around a hundred hundreds of pounds of metal mm-hmm. all the time. So he's so much fat. Year, years, decades of carrying around hundreds of pounds of metal has made him extra unbelievable yeah. strong. Like, I feel like that's the version of Wolverine that I want to see death match with Spider-Man <laughs> because Spider-Man's, you know, unbelievably fast too. Mm-hmm. And I think Spider-Man's stronger. Yeah. Wolverine. But with, Without the adamantium, the enhanced speed mm. and the strength of of being freed of all the training weights, yeah. forty years of training weights, and no and no and and, and the healing factor is no longer preventing your body from freaking out. <laughs> now it can like just do its thing. Mm. I I feel like that's like no longer Wolverine. That's like Honey Badger. Logan. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Honey Badger Logan. <laughs> Man. Have you seen any of the Doom Patrols? No, I haven't. Like I haven't Man, I, you should definitely be watching Doom Patrol. I, I've like I I've only seen um I've like seen one like picture and it, I had no idea what it was. The D C stuff, right? Yeah. Okay. It's like um Grant Morrison wrote the original stuff and they they've abstracted some of it but they've stuck with a lot of the shit so like one of the characters is like a genderqueer street like an actual street it's like a sentient street that can move itself and like appear in a different town, wherever it wants to. It is the the road. It's called Danny Street. It lives in the road. It is the road. It is the road. It is the city, or it's like its own self-contained little town, but it's not. It's a street. It's as if like Fourth Street in Bloomington was sentient. It, it could, could reappear move anywhere it wanted. Yeah. So Fourth Street could. But it was also gender queer. Explicitly okay. gender queer. <laughs> oh yeah. That's like part of it. It's about thing. to get really interesting. I mean, and it, it, well, it's funny that they, they, they kept that part of the character. What kind of shops are on, on Danny Street? Well, it's like um, a fucking and, um, do the cabaret. People, like, a cabaret is one of the main places that you see. And it's people, like drag drag queens. Do the there. people that work there, do they travel with the street? Mm-hmm. So they're, they're part of the street. Yeah, it, it, it picks up people who are not accepted where they're at basically and so it provides it, them a place to be symbiotic exactly. relationship with them yeah and what is what is what does it get from them cover it's their mask well it's it just it makes it coexist yeah, yeah. It, it gives the street life yeah that's all it gets from them okay that's what's so crazy. That's a really cool character. It is a cool character but it's it's interesting that they were able to do that so then there's this other does character does it talk well, it communicates through signs. Yeah. So it's like... Visual communication. Yeah. yeah. So then there's this other character called Crazy Jane, who's got 64 different personalities, and all of them have superpowers. <laughs> but one of them's called Silver Tongue, and her power is she can speak, like, words that become real and they can she can use the words as weapons so like if she says what the fuck the words will appear and then she can use them as like weapons and they but they they do this in a way that it works where you're like weaponizes words yeah i mean it's it's like they're doing all this shit where they're they're going in directions with characters that you wouldn't necessarily it wouldn't work on screen uh, ten years ago, even five years ago, I don't think it would work on a, even like big or small screen necessarily, just because people wouldn't be willing to go there with with the creator. But so then there's like, well, wait, is it is is it kind of like? It's not. It's not derived from the Matrix. Is oh it, God, no, no. It's, it's, it's pre. It's, I'm pretty sure it's pre-exist Matrix. Like um, the style of that is they're using. 
But I mean, like, like this has like the style has nothing to do with Matrix. But I'm I'm fairly positive Grant Morrison wrote these before the Matrix. No, no, no that's what I mean. I mean the the visual the visual like style the, comics. the visual style itself. It's they're not they're not borrowing from like that kind of science fiction. They're using oh, a different, no. like, completely no, different. No, it's completely different. It looks like a comic book. Okay, that's what I'm saying. The way so then. Like, the way that it's executed, it looks like you're watching a comic book in between frames. Huh. Like, you don't see the frames, but that's the way it, fe- it feels like a comic book. Yeah. So then there's a... Fucking the- Ingley failed so hard when he tried to make the Hulk a comic book oh, presentation. God. That was like... Yeah. No. Um, the Angley was not, not... I fell asleep during that one. I remember... <laughs> um, yeah. But the, but the no, villain... I definitely fell asleep during that. The villain, Mr. Nobody... He can narrate things into existence. Yeah. So, but he also breaks the fourth wall. So he'll be talking to the people watching the TV show and then talking about something that's happening in the scene. And the people who are in the scene you know, interesting. can hear him, you know, it's but he's talking to both. Is that when you describe that, that's actually how I remember the Purple Man. Uh Jessica Jones foil. Oh, oh. So in the greater Avengers universe, he has this much more important role of, of taking over all of the Avengers except mm-hmm. for Thor and Banner. Or, or the Hulk because he can't control the Hulk. He just can't. No yeah. one can control the Hulk. <laughs> the Hulk can't even control yeah. the Hulk. <laughs> well, they made that character really good on Jessica Jones. Yeah, no, no, I know. But there's like, a, they, they did a really good yeah. job. In but that's, that's like how I remember reading The Purple Man is that mm-hmm. he was just like... You just start narrating actions, and then and then he'd be he'd be talking one frame, and then the, and all the other cells, you'd see like the yellow box which which has him continue narrating, and then all the stuff's happening. And it's like, and then at one point he's talking to you. Yeah, I, so that's I, I think that's that, how Mister Nobody they think, execute that perfectly. I think characters like that are fantastic because the way that they, that they engage the the audience, it's 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 more of a mind. Interaction, oh, yeah, than, yeah. than simply like staring at at the cells, and it's and it's it's strange because it's like it's like a um, psycho comics, psycho. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. It's like with 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 music or with with sounds we have psychoacoustics, mm-hmm. and but there's this like it's with literature. What is it? I, I don't know. I can't. I, I can't. This is escaping me. There's 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 got to be some kind of way to describe the, th- the phenomena within literature where, like it's like an extra level of engagement because of the the way that the the narrative unfolds. I mean, it it allows the the person who has written it has anticipated how the the reader is going to interpret yeah. it in a way that is so. Um, <laughs> anticipatory that it catches the reader off guard and breaks the fourth wall while maintaining the um uh what's it called um illusion of um what's it called when when you when you drop the perception that it's fake like yeah. Oh, the suspension of disbelief. Suspension of disbelief. Yeah. So it, it's a, it allows... You really like, just reminded me of A Midsummer Night Dream. Right. <laughs> if, if, if a person is able to break the fourth wall while maintaining the ability of the reader to, to have suspension of disbelief, then it creates an ethereal connection between the writer and the reader that transcends the piece through a, di- a direct communication yeah. and it's it's like a weird it's like hyperspace like, communication it is it is and it is something where it 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 shows you that literature and verbal communication is a form of telepathy but we discount it because it's happening usually in real time but in reality we're just analyzing frequencies really quickly yeah. And it's just frequency analysis at a high level, <laughs> but we take it for granted. Yeah. And that, and that's that's kind of where, you know, when you when you realize, or when you learn, it's not it's not a question. Every time someone has a conversation, they have to address the alphabet 
they have to address the language they're speaking they have to address the grammar structures they have to address the syntax the, the syntax the vernacular the local colloquialisms all of those things have to be taken into account before you say a sentence like if if someone asks you hey what's your name you process so many things before you answer that that people have become so accustomed to that they're automatic that now we have high level uh, operations that we look at as like low level operations because we're just so used to them and yeah. we, we've like diminished the meaning of them well it's like people who think that they have enough time to operate their phone and have a phone conversation while driving yeah and they've yeah. got kids in the back that they're trying to manage oof I, that kills me man I, st I don't I don't talk while driving um, I mean I have hands free and it goes to the speaker, and I still don't talk as as much as possible. And it, it like it annoys me when people do just because the difference between that and somebody who's sitting in your car is the people who are sitting in your car are another pair of eyes and on the same road that you're on. So it's not the same as having somebody on the phone. It's it's a completely different scenario. Yeah. That person has no idea what you're what is happening around you where somebody sitting in the car next to you knows exactly what's happening so <laughs> if a car is about to hit that person then they'll probably stop what they're saying like the person sitting in the passenger oh, seat <laughs> exactly there'll be another eyes and they'll give you a warning i've been there actually where i was in the back seat and the person driving um didn't see somebody merging into their lane i was like you know it was my uh friend's older sister when we were you know, not old enough to drive, but she was driving us around. And I was like, oh shit, somebody's merging. And because I saw it and she didn't, she was able to move out of the way, didn't get hit. If she was on the phone with me, I wouldn't be able to see that. Yeah. Like, and there's no reason she would, you know, but it's the idea that that person is somehow equal to the person sitting in the car, it's it's a, it's an absurd notion. Oh, it's, it's, um... <laughs> phones in general are really it's a scary technology my my dad and I we went to lunch with my mom and dropped her off at, at school dropped her off at IU and she gets out of the car she's walking towards Ballantyne Hall and I see this girl walking kind of towards us and she's got her she's buried in her phone and she walks this really weird squiggly line that to me is like you know, maybe five, ten extra steps. Mm -hmm. But the, she could have walked in a straight line. But she didn't know where she was going. She, had, she was too busy on her phone. Yeah. And it was, you know, my, my dad refers to the to that behavior as uh, a fondle slab behavior mm -hmm. because you know, she was just sitting there, just like touching the touching mm -hmm. the phone, not paying attention <laughs> to everything else, just getting a lot of driving some some level of of you know, satisfaction well it's escapism and yeah. i think this is where what what ends up happening is we've gotten to a point where so many people are needing escapism constantly that when people are reminded that those people need an escape it makes people want to then like ironically talk bad about those people yeah you know what i mean it's like one of those things where the whole reason kids play video games and are in the cell phones is because they don't want to get fucking bullied and life sucks yeah. and the parent like the adults don't want to stop global warming but but <laughs> but, then we, but, but then we've got examples of like you know somebody wants to text message and walk so somebody develops an app so that the camera will show them the ground in front of them right. and, then, yeah. and then they still end up getting hit by a car yeah. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> or, they, or they still end up walking into a, a street pole or into other people or they trip and fall anyways because they're still not paying attention even though yeah. they can see the ground in front of them so no, I mean, <laughs> yeah, man, it's it's a weird place because, I, again, I. But you know, they just ordered a pizza that'll be at their front door by the time they get home, so maybe it'll all work out, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know, man. That's that's one of those weird things. You know, when I think about escapism, I think of like. 
planning some trip into to drive up into like the badlands or into teton or glacier national park and drive into nature find some trail and drive off onto a trail that takes me 20 miles away from the next closest person so that i can experience nature and escape and part of the the idea is i mean part of all of it is escaping reality by thinking about this but then you know the idea that i might actually do this also because it would be really awesome to see that stuff because I, I feel like you know that's why we that's why we have branch a branch of the government that's set out to preserve those things and that's like the one area of of conservative brain that makes sense to me conserve our environment <laughs> <laughs> like it, 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 actually, it actually it's like astonishing it's like to me that's like People forget that freaking Nixon established the EPA. Like, for all the weird shit that he did, mm -hmm. he gave us the EPA. Hmm. I mean, I don't forgive him for all the weird shit because, you know, we, we don't <laughs> forgive our presidents for anything, apparently. Yeah. But, like, you know, EPA, yeah, I, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> we have it. We have an entity that does this we just need to give them more money to function yeah. properly yeah they're <laughs> effectively <laughs> less powerful than like what the oil industry's yeah. uh, advertising agencies oh yeah <laughs> they're way less powerful than oil agencies no like uh, well, I mean here's the thing so if we have the EPA but we just had the diesel scandal Oh man, yeah. Well, you know what I mean. It's weird how even Volkswagen really bastards and every other freaking and Mercedes and yeah, BMW. Everybody had and well. They were all in on it. They had to. Well, they they were all they were all in on it. it it's well, just, it's just not that they were. All, here's caught. what happened was once Volkswagen passed the test by cheating, everyone else, everyone else had to cheat to pass the test yeah. too. Because Volkswagen had cheated, so yep. it was like they all had to get it. They, everybody had to do it. Well, they didn't have to. Well, the big well, trucks, American they, American diesel trucks, didn't have to do it because they're like, we're trucks. We don't have to abide by your <laughs> tiny car rules. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which is where I'm 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 looking at it, and besides the electric cars, obviously the well, which those still burn fossil fuels at the plants that charge yeah. the stations because they haven't switched over and also in, in most cases. all of the machines used to, to dig up that lithium yeah and yeah it's super destructive it's an extremely um yeah just just there's no environmental impact survey that says it's a good idea yeah. to 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 mine lithium it's no. just it's all about money for sure like the uh the, the the show Top Gear, the BBC show Top Gear, they did one of their their former hosts. Uh, he was really anti Toyota Prius. He called him Prius, and um, he was complaining about how, for the price of a Toyota Prius, you could have bought that year's BMW um, Oof. mid mid level five series turbo diesel yeah. with like 300 horsepower and 500 pounds of torque and you know a, that's a freaking nice car mm. I, you can buy that that vehicle and drive it if money's not an option you can drive it drive the shit out of it drive it everywhere for you know the rest of its life and it will still have a lower carbon footprint than the batteries of that Prius mm -hmm. yeah a free and, and he's drive, talking about driving it balls out like a sports yeah, car, like, yeah, yeah. like, and it's true, it's true. And then, and of course, and of course, here's the the best part of, is that if you take every civilian automobile produced since the beginning of the automobile and combine all of those carbon footprints, it's still lower than the U.S. military's carbon footprint for like <laughs> for like a week or something like that. <laughs> like the entirety of, of civilian yeah. carbon output, including that. homes and fire bonfires oh. and uh, that that whole age of of you know <laughs> no regulation and leaded fuel. Like the U.S. military has been the biggest waste of humankind. <laughs> 
Like, this, like, not the people. The people involved were just trying to do some shit right with their lives. But the actual military and everything associated with it has been an entire waste of civilization's, like, energy and efforts. And this is where I'm like, it's just like I'm Jimmy not trying Carter to blame saying. white men. But you got to get to a point where you look at, like, where America has taken the rest of the world with our policies and be like, hey, this is not right. Like, this shit has to fucking stop. Every Everything about this direction is wrong. We're destroying the entire fucking planet. Me too. Hashtag me too. Just look at that. Well, because then it's like, the only reason me too happened is because this country has pushed its fucking bullshit morals on the rest of the world and tried to be like, oh, you need to be Protestant Christian and you need to be Catholic Christian man. and you need to be repressed and all this bullshit. And you got all these people running around repressed China has 18,000 miles of high-speed rail, and we have 40. <laughs> we might have 60. Oof. We might have. We might, we might even have 100. Not continuous. <laughs> well, it's crazy, because then I look at it And as, then like, we've really advanced uh, trains like the New York-DC corridor, but that's not actually a high-speed rail. You know how you're talking about, okay... No, this is high-speed like, rails, actually. We don't actually have high-speed rails in this country. We have test oh, God, facilities yeah, that no, are high-speed no, rails. Fuck no. And they're all private. You and can't even use them. What I was going to say is, think about that... We've gotten... Okay, we're not very far. But all of the people who have been in charge have only let white males lead things. They've only let their, their crony white males who will pay to get into college do the, lead the things. So we've gotten here based on nothing even remotely close to an actual meritocracy. Like, people have said it's a meritocracy. We know it's not even fucking remotely close to a meritocracy. Now that we know that shit, now that kids are removed from that layer of bullshit, now that kids aren't going to go out thinking that they can compete or that they even should try to compete on the same track as some kid who was born into a rich family. Like, no, you go do your own thing. You go on this track because this is the only track that you can actually make something of yourself on Try and like don't try to compete to the, with this kid because you're not gonna win on this race. Yeah. Now that we've gotten to a point where we can say no, we can't run this race. Let's run these other races. It's like now we can finally focus on different forms of society and different forms of economics and say, hey, like maybe we should have a ride sharing service that only has women drivers for women, like. Why is that something that people get pissed off about? That only protects the fucking predator males. Like, a guy who wants to drive taxis isn't going to be impacted if women have a ride-sharing service. I'm, I'm actually uh, always surprised. It's similar to this. I've, I've, I've seen a lot of um, drink recipes show up that aren't even drink recipes. It's like, ladies, if you're out on a bad date, go ask for this type of drink. Or go go uh, ask for this type of you know thing, and there and there's several different names, but it always surprises me in in the, in the comments of these these memes or these articles where they talk about this stuff. There's always some guy who's like, I don't think this is necessary, oh, and it's like God, it's dude. like well apparently it is because somebody's <laughs> made a freaking meme out of it. Like yeah. if something is meme worthy. Yeah. It exists. Well, they haven't they haven't seen enough bathrooms where they have this shit where it's oh like, my God. you know, like damn near every bathroom in a woman's, I like, or in a in a woman's bathroom on most campuses, they're gonna have like shit about sexual assault prevention and what to do if you're sexually assaulted. But it's not that shit in the men's bathrooms nope. where who the actual men's bathrooms is like for a good time call some number that doesn't yeah. actually lead to anything. Or, that, or it's like some dude's ex-girlfriend that he's like pissed off yeah. at. Yeah. And he's actually put his ex-girlfriend's number up there. Which is just disgusting. Which happens. Yeah. Like, you know, these. this is the type of shit where dudes use like I mean, not, not it, just okay. It, in my just, mind, you're supposed to put up like the the suicide prevention hotline in the men's room, so that some asshole who thinks they're calling Cindy for a good time actually ends up calling a suicide oh God. prevention hotline. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard one of the things now is girls give, like it's like a number that gives um, John Cena 
there's like a John Cena recording and it goes into this like theme music like you can't see me or some shit <laughs> And it's like the fake number they give out now where there's like all these fake numbers that girls are, I mean, amongst themselves know to give out to dudes who don't know how to say, like, how to take no for an answer. But then it's like the guys who don't understand or who pretend they don't understand what it's like for women's existence. It, and then they try to act like. There, there's some dude out there who got mad that I didn't say, but women do it too at the beginning of this. Because those are the types of people we have to coexist with. They have this idea that because we're trying to strive for equality, that now if you don't, if you talk about the ills of men, if you don't talk about the ills of women, that you're the asshole. Now you're and being that's, unequal. That's, and it's like that's this weird, the, that's like, bullshit. The, that's like the equivalency. meme with a dude in the water, a swimmer in the water, pouring water over his face and says, <laughs> when white men get the the rights they've been demanding or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> pool of water. <laughs> and see, I, I hate to like... Okay. I'm not trying to pick on white males because there's like a ton of white males who I'm friends with who are allies to, to minorities who are in many ways more vocal about black plight than I am in general. So it's like whenever it's weird to talk about America because you have this this there's like a specific group of white male that's like the worst of humanity. Oh yeah. It's like and we're, what we're dealing with is the actual Nazis. Well, They're know, actual Nazis. What's, what's so we can we should feel okay for calling them the worst of humanity. Fucked They're fucking is, Nazis. I, the, the guys like that that I've encountered, <laughs> they'll demonize black or Latino women, but then they fetishize Asian women. Yeah. And it was like, so what? Yeah. What? what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's really weird, man. It's really weird. <laughs> and, and, and in the back of my my, my mind, it's like. How many black women do you actually know? <laughs> <laughs> like, how many actually like have have you been able to become like anywhere anywhere close to beyond working in the same fucking building or having a class with them yeah. where you didn't even talk to them? Like, you know, that's like I, I feel like there's a lot of um, that's a lot of the media at work. Yeah, and, totally. Well, I you know, ever so often I'll have a conversation with someone on Facebook who's white and older and they'll say some shit that they clearly heard on Fox News and mm. they'll like and I'm and I'll have to call them out on it and and be like no you you're making this up like this guy said something like um he had a, a black neighbor blasting music about kill whitey and I'm like first off you live in Denver Colorado you don't have a black neighbor <laughs> First off, that's the first lie. Second off, no rappers out here talking about fucking kill Whitey because white pe like white kids are like the biggest consumers of wait, white, rap wait, music. There, there was like a, a it was like a, a satire rap poem. It was like kill, kill, kill the white man. It was um, like a, I think it was like a like an Eddie Murphy thing. I think I can't even remember, but you know, the, Listen, yeah, nobody's, nobody's doing, doing, that, doing shit. that shit. Nobody wants to kill anybody. White kids are like the most progressive people ever, the most accepting. No rapper is gonna try to ostracize white kids by talking about kill whitey. Like no fucking Dude, way, so, man. So Nelly's uh, big release is twenty years old. Have you you remember when Nelly? Which one? I, I can't remember. It was like a uh, country grammar. Yeah, country grammar. When that when that came out, like that was like twenty years old. Mm -hmm. That came out, and it's like, it's it was huge. It was everywhere mm -hmm. for like you know, oh, yeah. like three, four, five years. I think feel like we kept hearing just just songs off of that one album. So it's twenty years old, and I saw a, a buddy of mine on Facebook post something about how like it still bangs. Oh yeah. So I like yeah. I go back and I find it because I actually had that on CD once, and I like listen to it. And it's like, man. We were kids when music was so good. Like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> some, of the, some and, and, and the, hey, my, okay. Here's it was the like, thing: it wasn't. Kids it, don't have good taste, man. Yeah, 
So when we're like this, when we're fetishizing what we liked when we were 13, we're fetishizing what we liked when we had fucking shitty tastes like these little kids right now. So that's like, when I go back and listen to Nelly, Nelly's no better, like than Lil Nas X. It sounded so good. I mean, it's the same, and, and this is you have nostalgia and the music, but. You can't do that for new shit. That, that's the thing about some nostalgia. Sounds, some of the new stuff sounds really good, too. I know. That's, but some that's it, what I'm... Get, I think, there's no difference. I think as I get older... There, people will say there's a diff, There's no fucking difference. No, no, there's difference, no real man. difference. There's no I difference. Think, I think what's, what, I'm, what I'm experiencing as I get older is that it's easier for me to say, this is shit, and mm-hmm. this actually is good. Exactly. And, and, exactly. and so when I hear Nelly now, it's like, this was actually it's, it was, really good. It's still good. good. It was good. But it's, and, not, it's not like... I mean... I don't, I don't think that it's like any better than any other number one release. Okay, let me think in that, about in this. that real in that in the in the context of time, like when when these things are happening, because they're kind of time sensitive. Like we can't really listen to Nelly's music and be like, yeah, that makes sense now, because it's it's a time it's a time machine. It's a it's a time capsule in a lot of ways. So, do you remember my mom's playing tricks on me? Yeah, Ghetto Boys. Yeah, when that video came out, that shit was like groundbreaking. In a way, that country grammar was groundbreaking sonically because he had mixed singing and a little bit of country like twang in it. In yeah. a way that had, had, had it a little was swing like, to it. Exactly, they call it like Midwest swing. Yeah, there was a whole song called Midwest yeah. Swing. In fact, so it was, like the, bone, it was like post it was post Bone Thugs Harmony. Yeah, but Nelly created his whole whole new sound. Well quote-unquote new by mixing in another genre yeah. and then he did country for a brief period and he got didn't really get accepted nope. so this is one of those things where <laughs> he wasn't darius rucker <laughs> no well contextually now we have this dude Lil nas x who if these kids aren't aware of nelly they're gonna think Lil nas x is like the inventor of country rap right but that's which, he's which, not he's not i mean he's not at all but what you then end up realizing is like now there's like a whole line of white country rappers that have gone and done the whole Nelly thing that yeah. Nelly wasn't allowed to do and they're doing it and then so when Lil Nas X comes on and like tries to release that shit and is like kicked off the country billboards it's not cuz they don't listen to that music yeah. it's because they don't want Lil Nas X being number 1 on the country Shit, like wait, the same way they oh, want wait, no, I, I know you're one. talking about. That was the that's the that was the the guy. He had a, he had a track that like Billy Ray Cyrus mm-hmm. came and did a, a remix a because, remix because he was like, no, this is actually real. This yeah. is the real deal. And then all of a sudden, it shoots right to the top. So then this kid, he broke Drake's streaming record. He had the number one and number two streaming tracks in the same week because it was the the regular one in the remix with Billy Ray Cyrus. Wow. <laughs> so, and then my thing is so. This kid might be an industry plant, but I don't give a fuck because if if industry plants are used to get people like behind something, I'm totally fine with galvanizing people behind this positive little black dude who all like yeah, yeah, yeah. he's super positive. I've been following him on Twitter. Like seeing what he's all about. No, we need like, positive. We need positive people like that, and that's why I'm like, <laughs> if he's in the industry plant, I don't even give a fuck at this point, and I'm gonna support him just because I want more positive people out here like that. But it's at the same time, it's it's super sketchy because the kid only has like four hundred thousand. He only had like two hundred thousand Twitter followers at first, and now he's only like maybe he's probably at five hundred thousand now. But he's got like over forty million plays, or it's like. Probably in the eighty million, like some ridiculous amount of plays. Something at this unnatural. Point. Uh, something unnatural for him not to have have a million Twitter followers now. Like for all the people who are listening to this shit to not go follow him on Twitter. Unless, that's super sketch. Well, you know, maybe there there some are sketch there are it. ways to get songs played more um, on like internet radio. Oh, absolutely. So if, if somebody's well, buying this is here's some, the thing. If somebody's buying a license for how, how many plays did you say? 
It's 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 over forty million. Like the last I looked, it so was somebody, over forty million. But here's the thing: so that at least somebody, somebody bought a license to play it forty million times. Then, well, some somebody called it out. The tracks are like less than two minutes a piece, oh. and what ends up happening is the listening. streaming. Yeah, the streaming limit is you have to play for thirty seconds to hit a stream. That's all you have to play is thirty seconds. So, because it's short, you want to play it again. So. People are hearing it and then they want to hear it again because it's not a full it's not a full song what they're used to. People are used to three at least three minute songs. So if you get two minutes, then you're gonna replay it the second time. So recently I was naturally uh, Pioneer does this this new software called Record Box mm -hmm. and then Serato and, and Tractor and even uh, the software package that Denon uses and, and I'm sure that Virtual DJ does now too they're all uh, able to tap into online streaming libraries mm -hmm. and so I imagine that any time that one of these tracks gets pulled off the internet that isn't hosted locally that's kind of the stream as well so, so some party DJ who's using two versions of it on multiple decks or, or sampling it live yeah. they might be actually triggering multiple plays oh yeah because oh, yeah. 30 seconds isn't that long no no so i bet they are i bet they totally and, are and if, and if like an on the fly remix involves like you know three or four decks of the same song and see here's the thing when people when i say industry plant i don't i don't mean that lil nas x got into a room with these industry people and they were like, we're going to blow you up. He doesn't even know what's happening. Like, these people are paying to get, like, potentially paying to get him super popular and get him a bunch of fucking listens, sign him on a deal, and then the record company gets big off this clout. Because it's like, you had fucking... The end, Avengers Endgame people advertising for it. Fucking Dr. <laughs> Phil. There's, like, Joe Rogan did a video about it. <laughs> like, what the fuck, man? It's such a weird thing we're where you're like... We're talking about it, too, so... Well, we're talking about it. I'm talking about it because I think it's discuss is worthy of discussing yeah. if he's an industry plant. But I'm saying I don't care... Just for the fact that he's a positive... If this kid was out here talking about fucking sipping on lean or, like, doing <laughs> drugs and shit like that, I would not... I would not care... Like, I, I would be going after this kid, but wow. he's, like, talking about skipping, like, Coachella to stay home and clean his house so he doesn't piss off his dad. And that's what I'm like. We need more of that. Holy cow, what the... Like... You know, this is this is this is what happens when a generation watches. No, this is what happens to the children of a generation who grow up watching all of their heroes die from yep, drug overdoses that's exactly what happens. and all this that's horrible exactly shit. What happens, and man. so those kids, they don't want to ever. They don't want that because mm -mm. they know what happens when you party so hard that you die. Yep. Like, and and this, I mean, they're they're aware of like getting too wrapped up in the in the social media hype more than people give them credit for cuz like i actually went and talked to a high a group of high school kids um and this was before the whole cardi b bullshit i mean she's always bullshit but you before know, so it came weird. out like okay so here's my here's my complaint about cardi b's like every time i hear her music it's like it's it sounds actually it sounds really good it it's because it's produced. It's, it's really well produced. It's a formula. But it's like, like the, 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 the lyrical content of the music that I'm hearing, probably because it's what they're trying to sell, mm -hmm. is like not doesn't inspire anything. But then she makes these really seemingly profound political so, or socially conscious no, statements. No, she doesn't. No, no, no. Like that, like that, that somehow emerged from the ether. That's like, wait, what the fuck is this? Because they've been doctored. Because yeah, well, it's been like the shit she's no, not, that's, the that's, shit she's saying so, so isn't that's, profound. That, that's, what, that's the like, thing. She got wrapped up with Bernie. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That's, that's not what I mean. Like, the, like, thing, the thing that, that I'm having problems reconciling is that like they're having there's this there's this this character that emerges in her music mm -hmm. and then there's this thing that they're trying to thrust out into the media yeah and you know tab a and slot d do not work in yeah. this in this scenario and it doesn't jive with me and it's like there's this part of this just like okay political consciousness aside and even if that is correct 
like it doesn't jive with the character that she's presented in her music. And, right. and my understanding of musicians is that they are like inextricably tied, connected to that thing. Like they don't, yeah. they don't, they're like more. They're so honest about things that they tell the fucking history of rock and roll museum to fuck off. Mm -hmm. Like that's like that's how that's how they are. That's how musicians yeah. are. They're they're not they're supposed in, to be. That's what they're supposed to be. Yeah. And so when when I when presented with this like, you know, rap ingenue who is like changing the game because all these things, I have I can't reconcile the music that they're creating with the public image that there is being presented. Like those things don't don't well, and, and then they're not musicians. Me. First off, they're entertainers. Yeah, they're performers. And that's that's what that's one of the problems is like you have all these rappers that are performing and it's an act. I don't think it's well. It is sort of an act for her in the sense that she okay. She doesn't have to talk like that necessarily. Nope. She doesn't have to act like that. She wants to portray hood. She wants to portray fucking ghetto she wants to portray like uh, so so she's she like, wants to act like she's a struggle queen even once she's hit this point where she's not yeah. which is because she's taking money and attention from the people that she's imitating she's like wearing a costume that she doesn't have to wear anymore you don't see beyonce out here talking like that no but she beyonce like, the first track she was on was, like, a fucking No Limit. Like, she wasn't talking ghetto. Beyonce never went that. <clears throat> but she very well could have. Because a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of people who were present... It, it's like, uh, I, I, I watched... Um, there, were, there, there was an interview where they were talking about how female rappers are more of an investment because you have to deal with like so much of the hair and, and the clothing and the look and then it's like but what about Missy Elliott well be, but she, she, she only like, got big after she was like in the background for like a decade yeah and the only reason she got lucky I mean I I feel like she, she got lucky that people weren't hung up on her weight yeah because if if people would have got hung up on her weight it like it happened well yeah. They still made fun of her, and she got a fucking um, surgery, yeah, like, and then, act, and then try to act like she didn't get it. Uh, she you, tried to lie about you it. You know, it's it's funny. Like, I feel like she didn't want people to. In a lot of ways, she judge. she laid the template for modern rap. In oh, a lot, totally. Like, like everything that I hear, like I know that uh, was it Gucci Mane and is is tied to mumble rap, like deeply tied to it or something like that. Somehow, like. Well, it's really future. Oh, future. Um, Gucci Mane is like trap, and then Ti is like really. They give him credit for creating trap. I mean, some people do and some people don't, but it's it's, I know, it's but pretty like much all, Gucci or Ti. Like that, but that like those sounds but, to me like I feel like I heard them. They're like a. a if there was a duet, they're trying to have a duet with Missy Elliott. <laughs> Like those, the, the the compatibility of the styles is what is like what would, would always like. Uh, yeah. it, like I feel like like she's she like emerges and she's like I'm the queen and this is the language. Come speak to yeah. me and, and and everyone else is like, it's like oh this is this is what's up. Well, and it's because she was writing for everybody and there, and a lot of people didn't realize she was oh. ghostwriting for so long. So when she finally came out, she did her own style and she showed that was really own. everybody else. Yeah. like like what had they have used from her so this is kind of the same thing with Drake where huh, that's like a that's Drake like is a, like an amalgamation of ghostwriters that's a freaking egg chicken situation yeah but she's the chicken and the egg yeah like not many people can be the chicken and the egg yeah um cause then you get people like uh man who's there's not many rap ghostwriters that transition um, Rhyme Fest is one. I think that's like. I, I think <laughs> Not, that's, he didn't really. I think that's what, what what you're getting at is it has to do with the differences between the musician and the performer. I think we're we've reached a point where musicians don't necessarily perform. No, and, and like in, and they don't have to be authentic. And, yeah. and this is like I think. I, so getting back to Cardi B, I'm fairly positive. Offset writes her shit, so. 
like, or maybe he started writing her shit and she may start, she may be writing it now. <laughs> I remember reading so a, a it's like a dude about, writing for a woman. Yeah, I remember reading an article about a English heavy metal band and they described them as an authentic band, metal band. Like, they were actually a band and they actually, their, like, tattoos were real. <laughs> 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 like, that kind of shit. And, and I thought That's about it, it's like, it's like, well, I mean, there are a lot of, a lot of bands are just created. Mm -hmm. Like, it might be a singer, songwriter, who has who hires the performers to play for him yeah. basically well but here's the difference okay so this to me is the difference between that's like Kanye. being a band leader but not being in the band well kind of uh, it's like it's like the gorillas yeah so this is to me why people who hate on Kanye don't really understand what he's doing versus like fucking Dude, Cardi B. So, so so Kanye's making the beats in most cases and writing a lot of his own I mean he gets ghostwriters. He's not a great he's not a great rapper, but he's a great uh he's a recording composer. Artist. He's a recording artist. Yeah. And what he puts I mean, together as as a piece his live stuff is actually quite incredible. Oh yeah. It's yeah. like it's like holy shit incredible. Yeah. But it's also like I don't know what I'm listening to because I'm not actively listening to his his recordings. Mm -hmm. And so when I see it, it's there's a lot of um, there's a big visceral element that I'm missing because I'm watching a recording, usually a bad recording too, which is kind of yeah, whatever. It's just what it is. But you know, it's it's interesting. Like he he manages to do something I think that not very many people actually do anymore. Yeah, I mean it's it's. It's hard. I think it's really difficult for the recording artist to be, also be a, a musician, and also be the performer, because musicianship has become its own thing, mm -hmm. and it's totally. and it's and and, and and its own performance has its own pro performance criteria separate from just being a performer of any kind. And well, you can be a singer that's not really that is purely a musician, and you know. You have all the chops and and background and culture behind your voice. Never and be stuff. a performer. And never be a performer. Yeah, yeah. I and think just a lot of people recordings. expect those things to all be in the same person. Yeah. If they don't have any experience with them, like there's a reason you don't see Adele doing choreography. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, she's not. She's not. That's not what she does. No, of course. I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want her to. No. I, I would hate if if Adele tried to bust out like some fucking Beyonce choreography to try to like be that performer when she's a vocalist yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know I think part of the reason Beyonce has to do that shit is because I don't know I personally her voice sounds like it's borderline yodeling to me and like so many people love it but that shit is grating I can't stand it and, and to me I think a lot of what she did early on was to distract from the fact that her voice it's not that good. I don't care. Like, people can argue. She's she's a good vocalist. Like, Apparently, she has, like, perfect pitch. Oh, she does. No, and no, she like, does. Like, she can she, hear melodies and just she has harmonize her, to them okay. instantly. And she's, like, a very her, talented she's, singer. She's a very talented singer. I'm not trying to say that. But her voice is grating. Like, the quality of her it's voice It's grating as fuck. Is, like, it, when, just because Mariah Carey can hit that high note doesn't mean she Doesn't should. mean you enjoy it. Yeah, no. You know what I'm saying? And I love it's like, Mariah, dude. She's anybody, great. And she is. She's a fantastic she's, vocalist. She's so, but she's anybody who's voice. like, oh my God, but that high wants note. To hear that nobody wants to noise. fucking hear that shit. Yeah, it's whistles. You know what I'm saying? Or it's like, uh, <laughs> you know, there, there's some vocal artists where I'm just like, I, I know you're good or like Tom, uh, what's the name Tom uh, not Tom Petty um, uh, what the fuck is that dude Bob Dylan like he's one of the most prolific singers of all time I can't stand his fucking voice I can't stand his fucking voice like if a Tom or a Bob I, can't, I always mix him up with Tom Petty too like you know what I'm saying but you know, if a Bob Dylan song comes on that's yeah. not somebody else singing I fucking run and turn that shit off Man, I don't know me, you know oh my god <laughs> he's got dude. a mouthful oh. of fucking sausage <laughs> oh god so, I, I actually don't you know I I, I like certain songs and I like certain voices 
and I can't stand covers when people try to sing with somebody else's voice. Mm-hmm. And it's weird because there's a certain there's a certain range of of like vocal style where I think that people who, who pursue that kind of vocal ability, they all get kind of stuck in this range where they all sound alike. Mm-hmm. It's not because they don't have like a unique vocal personality. It's just because the music they sing is all the same, and it's all being, you know, composed and directed the same way, and the mm-hmm. output's always going to be the same because, you know, it's they're doing it as written or whatever, and there's it's not necessarily their, that that person's fault if their goal is to be a technical musician and to provide technical performances and you know highly demanding performances, but I think I think the reason that I've always or never really been interested in things like chamber music is because after a, a point, it's uh, a demonstration of technical perfection, mm-hmm. and there's a ceiling with some of these things. Like old ass instruments that have been around for three hundred years, they've pretty much nailed it. The only mm-hmm. reason they're still doing really cool things with like pianos is because of synthesizers. Right. And the only reason they're still doing cool things with guitars is because the technology is still somehow being developed, kind of kind of parallel to synthesizers. And, well, and then what ends up happening is, but even guitars are going away. Like the like the, like the sales of guitars haven't really dropped, but the concentration of guitars it seems to be moving more towards expensive instruments and less towards. That's that's what it is. Okay. It's not just guitars. It's everything. They're, they're, yeah, it's, it's everything that is a hard instrument because there is so much time and dedication associated with learning those things to that level that now they've become fetishized as the highest form because only the rich people can actually dedicate enough time and to learn money to, do, to do and to get the instruments to do it. Yep. Um, so that's why it's it's strictly left for the rich people, and that's why. People will say, oh, the symphony and chamber music is the highest form of music. But it's only because the rich people actually have the chance and the capacity to get to those, like, organizations to perform. You can't you can't come off the street and end up in a fucking symphony orchestra. It's not that you can't be good enough. It's just that they don't want or, or they want someone that has the technical proficiency to hit all the timbres and all of the proper on command. color and all of the thing on command, and you have to know the technical and theoretical yeah. idea so you can do it to their uh, whims. But that's the only that's the the only thing separating those people is the time to learn their lexicon for yeah. that specific it's a thing. That's that's a and that's what I've learned being in that you it's, know it's the difference between underground <laughs> electronic music and conservatory electronic music is that one of them makes me feel alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you see like the conservatory electronic music and it's bullshit, man. Oh my god, like I I, I was. No, I, I, it makes me wonder if they oh. if it's composed on like headphones and computer speakers. Like like do they have real playback systems because when I turn that stuff up really loud it doesn't sound right man one of the things they did at IU was they had the people in the audience use their cell phones as like the it was so terrible I mean I didn't even go I just read about it they they had the people like they wanted to be participatory no. and because it's digital they had to have everybody's cell phones and this is like what I use Jacob's School of Music was like passing off as fucking digital music it's sad, man. It's sad that you know, these so, old people can't... Like, I'm calling them old because of their mindset. They don't have to be Conceptually, that, that actually... That's not, that shouldn't be a music pr- uh, pursuit. That should be a, a digital media fine art pursuit. That 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 would be handled much more uh, appropriately within that, that framework, as, as digital mm-hmm. media as fine art, not as musician... I've always felt like clapping was like this thing that uh, drunk musicians came up with to cover up their mistakes. It's like, hey, everybody, start clapping. Okay, guys, we can take it easy for a few minutes. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Clapping is so weird. I always feel weird doing it. It's like, make organized, no- disorganized, organized noise. Like, are we supposed to all clap offbeat or on beat? Well, like, you, you got to start offbeat. You got to be like, right? 
And then eventually everyone around you's like, wait, what's going on? <laughs> I feel like every time people start clapping is an opportunity to break into We Will Rock You that's missed. <laughs> So I, I, I decided not to watch the Bohemian Rhapsody in its entirety. Mm. I saw like clips of it, and it was all sad. Mm, I it just made yeah. me sad. Like, it didn't tell me anything. It, I don't, I'm, and, and what I'm worried about is that, from what I read, is it's not going to tell me anything I didn't know. It's just going to focus on him being depressed and and all these other things that I don't want. I don't care about that. Queen was the biggest rock band to exist in all of eternity. For a long in time, and they made great music. And now this is the biopic we get. We get this thing that reminds us that he was like, like tortured and 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 wasn't always happy. And you know, like, I mean, at the same time, I'm glad that it exists. But you know, here here's the thing: Motley Crue made a, a biopic, and it re- reveres how hard they rocked and how they died. And you know, all these weird things that that like remind me that at one point rock and roll was this awesome force to be reckoned with and granted a lot of people died and that's fucked up and we don't like that but none of them were homosexual at a time when that's true they had to make songs about fat bottom girls to hide the fact that they were homosexuals that's true you know what I mean so that's where like on the one hand I can completely understand there's probably not a whole lot of joy in that dude's life towards yeah. like like when you're famous and you can't even be yourself yeah like to the my, public, I mean, like you have to make songs about fat bottom girls. My understanding is that like the joy in his life was his cats, <laughs> and, and, and in that movie, apparently the cats get like a minimal amount of screen time. Oh, that sucks. Like, I mean, you know, they, that's that's the thing is like everything that I read about this movie that, makes me not want to see it. That's like the, that's like the opposite of what's supposed to. And this movie got awards. How would how would you make Freddie Mercury not look crazy if you have him on screen talking to a bunch of cats like? It's the same thing if you had Nikola Tesla talking to a fucking to pigeons. pigeons. <laughs> yeah, like, for the end of his life to try to make him look happy when he's all poor and shit. And he's like, oh, the world has stolen my technology, dear pigeon, but we have each other. Like, I feel and like that's you would how call it, like, <laughs> he'd be like, Francois, they've taken everything from me. <laughs> Thomas lied to me every day. I realize this now. Fly away, Francois. Be free. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's like, yeah. that's how I see that going. Because in my mind, it's some weird steampunk romanticization of of the end of Tesla. Well, and that's like the Howard Hughes movie. Like, made him look crazy as shit towards the end. I think those guys are crazy as oh, shit, of course. though. I mean, yeah, I think you have yeah. to be to, to come up with shit like that. Like, yeah. you, you don't get to no, be. For sure, yeah. I, I don't think normal people get to have ideas like that. I don't think normal people get to mm-hmm. experience life like that. And and that's that's the thing is like with Freddie Mercury there is there were significant portions of their their entire musical careers and lives that they could have celebrated. Mm. And I don't see it, that wasn't reflected in any of the the reviews that I read mm. and that that it ultimately put me off from wanting to see it. It's just it's just sad stuff that I've already read about. Mhm. And then, and then I read that, like... I mean, the whole Live Aid thing was about fucking Ethiopian famine. It wasn't a... Like, it wasn't a good subject for the concert in the yeah. first place. Yeah. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, that was not a good time period. It <laughs> like, really wasn't. That sucks. Like, AIDS was rampant and out of control. Like... They finally gave it a name, they too. They were blaming gay... Like, gay... Homosexuality had just... Not be, had just well, not become a psychological before disease, before or, it was um, it was before it was AIDS and HIV they just called it GRID it was like it, it, it was about it was it was about homosexuality but I'm saying it was only I think it was either it was like sixty nine I think, they, I think it was actually gay related immune immunodeficiency disease or something like that immune disease immune disorder. It's it's only within the last forty years that being gay has been removed from being a mental disorder. Yeah, that's that's like that's 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 that's, yeah. that's a very short period of that's time. So fucked up. Like forty fucking years, dude. I wonder at what point though it became a real big problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, shit. <laughs> it's a good time. To think. Yeah. <laughs> Natural. Selection. Natural yep, selection. Yep. <laughs> hey. What do we got? 
after. We didn't even talk about Notre Dame. <laughs> <laughs> That's how important that actually is. Right. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> that's that's so good. It wasn't even important enough to talk about. Yeah. Well, that's good because screw those billionaires and their money. The, how much did the how much did the yellow uh, yellow yellow jackets the yellow vest want like forty million dollars over like ten years or something low? Yeah, it was some stupid. It was, low. it was like they just wanted basic basic raises or something. And over the course of the decade, it wasn't even supposed to be that much. Oh, nah, dude. It's... And then. Overnight, it's like yeah. overnight. They like their pledges of <laughs> you know a thousand times what they're asking for, and like, then the media blacks go. out the the fucking riots. Oh my god! It's well, cause then I didn't realize like I thought that the, I thought that the things, shit is happening in Britain too. Yeah, like because Brexit's totally seven hundred fifty people getting arrested is a lot, dude. That's like that's a lot unreal. of people. That's, that's a lot of fucking people. That's the entire political party. Yeah. Dude.